My name is Alistair Nolan. I am a senior policy analyst at the OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining, particularly our colleagues from the United States, in coming in from California, even where it's extremely early in the morning. Um, I must say that from the first two days of the workshop, we've had quite a number of emails where uh, experts have been expressing their appreciation for the general positive feedback on the presentations and, the, and discussion. Uh, and today we're going to uh, move the focus somewhat to a question which did arise uh, sort of tangentially yesterday, which is around the, the limits of AI in science. And after that, we'll have uh, much of the day dedicated to the broader systemic, systemic issues about um, the productivity of science and uh, Got some of the leading scholars of the science of science uh, who are addressing this question. And part we wanted to include this session because, um, uh, because while I suppose many of us who are many people here who are AI experts and know the various ways in which AI is contributing to science. Um, may have the sort of impression that AI alone will make a significant impact on the scientific uh, endeavor. But we want, to, we want to make a broader assessment about the, uh, whether AI sits on the critical path, if you like, to, to raising the productivity of science. Maybe there are broader incentive, incentives issues or whether peer review processes work, the allocation of, of public R&D funding, um, incentives for publication, et cetera, et cetera. And our experts will broach this uh, throughout much of the rest of the day. Um, there'll be then a final session uh, with a presentation from Ross King and Hector Zenil. Uh, around the quantification of uh, possible quant quantitative effects of AI on scientific productivity. And I'd like to thank Hector and Ross in particular because they'll be making our first presentation today as well as contributing later in the day. And I've also been instrumental in helping shape this workshop overall. So we have a really stellar set of participants and discussants today, uh, beginning with our moderator, Tony Hay, who's the Chief Data Scientist at the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the United Kingdom, as well as having multiple uh, other affiliations. Alessandra Coleccio will moderate the second session. Alessandra is the head of the Science and Technology Policy Division at the OECD, and then I will, I will take over for the final, uh, final session. And I'd encourage everyone to feel free to raise questions, add points, and participate actively in the discussions throughout. So with that, I'll hand over to Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here and uh, to be introducing this, this session. What, what I would like to do is just use uh, three or four slides just to show uh, where we are and how their, their, their uh, contribution will fit into this. And so I would just like to say a few words about where the uh, the overview of people using AI in science and, and, and so on, just this as an introduction to Hector and, and Ross's talk. So uh, one of the most significant things happened with uh, the science at experimental facilities. This is uh, Ernest Lawrence with the cyclotron, the first cyclotron ever built at Berkeley, what is now Berkeley Laboratory. And as you can see, it's no longer a professor, a postdoc, and a student. These people are needed to make the science work. And it's a team sport. You need people who are engineers, people who need to put the apparatus together. And of course, this is now an extreme uh, Call it to extremes at CERN, where you have a thousand physicists collaborating on, a, on an experiment. But team science is a new feature. And, and for example, at Berkeley, you have a number of, of, of data sources, light sources, genome sequencing, telescopes, particle detectors, and microscopes. And all of these produce huge data sets. And you have computers, you have computer scientists, statisticians, and the user community coming to use these facilities. And this is how science is done in this team way you need a multidisciplinary teams to do it and so um, the question of whether science is, is is slowing down or not to me is is, is a complicated question and uh, it's done in a different way looking at more complex questions um, what we're going to hear about later uh, from from Ross and Hector uh, is 
one topic which is extremely important. With the huge amounts of data coming from these facilities, they will be overwhelming scientists. They're all upgrading the detectors, which are recording data faster, and they're making bigger machines and more intense machines, producing more and more amounts of data. So robot scientists uh, are a key feature, how, how you automate the experiments. And it's not, it's not, it, this is different for different fields. Some fields are more susceptible to automations than others. Uh, and the other challenge, I think, for, for, for science today is that um, uh, what one wants is, is, is the data uh, and the papers linked together and published. So this is uh, the pioneers of open access and open science were the U.S. National Library of Medicine with their open access policy. And PubMed Central is a database, not just for abstracts, but for the whole content of the paper. And it's linked to data sets with the DOI. And then you can search the various data sets that are kept by the US National Library of Medicine, genome databases, phylogeny, nucleotide sequences, and you can go from one to the other and so on. And that's what you'd like to be able to do and find out relevant papers. The challenge is that about two abstracts a minute are deposited in the National Library of Medicine PubMed database of abstracts of biomedical papers. So this is just in the biomedical thing. Two abstracts a minute, every minute of every hour, every hour of every day, every day of the year. And there's no way you can keep up with that. And what actually they're trying to develop is intelligent tools to help you search that, not just keywords, going beyond keywords, looking at uh, concepts. And they're using technologies like, for example, deep learning about, which is one of the subsets of machine learning, which has made most advances. So these are the things that I think we need AI to help to do science, to deal and manage with the huge data sets, to automate science, to actually search and get content from multi-modal type experiments where you have different data sets combined together. Uh, and scientists are not just able to cope by themselves. So AI has to make a difference there. And uh, I think I'll just end with this. AI won't replace scientists. In my view, they will be complementary. But scientists who use AI will replace those who don't. This was from a Microsoft report where actually scientists was a teacher. Science, AI won't replace the teacher, but teachers who use AI will replace those who don't. So um, let me stop sharing there uh, and uh, go now to um, the session. Uh, and. Um, I'm told that you need to keep your cameras on, but mute, uh, please, when you're not speaking uh, and raise it. There's a, a, a feature in Zoom. You can raise your hand and uh, each speaker has 15 minutes and five minutes for questioning. So, uh, Hector, are you going to start talking today? Yes, I will. Thank you, Tony. Very good, Hector. Over to you. Thanks. Great. So together with Ross, we are going to be talking about current limits of AI in science. And good morning, everyone. Um, so first of all, there has been um, a lot of hype cycles in AI, but uh, this time looks like making more progress and contributions to science. So it feels a little bit uh, different, and especially with machine learning that is now the hottest technology around the world, including in science, everybody's using uh, at least some uh, version of machine learning, uh, mostly statistical, but we are also moving towards more um, causal driven approaches and, and making progress. And obviously we are all aware that the largest companies are uh, using um, machine learning at the core of the, their technology, including Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, and you name it, and not only in the West, but also in the East. So I think one uh, great way to understand the challenges of AI in science is just to talk about, the, first of all, the challenges that a AI and machine learning has, uh, period, eh? not only in science, but in general. So one of those, and then, by the way, it is particularly more concerning in science, and we are going to cover uh, why. So one first uh, challenge is scalability. Right? So current uh, machine learning requires a lot of data that sometimes we do have and sometimes we don't in science. And especially the problem is that that data has to be uh, most of the time annotated and labeled, and that is a difficult task. 
then there's a problem of understandability. So current models deal poorly with things like reasoning, modeling, inference, abstraction, and those sort of things that we are so interested in science. Um, there's also a problem of explainability. So it is not a surprise for all of us, uh, the term uh, black box. So most of the uh, neural networks approaches, for example, are black boxes because if you open them, uh, you don't have a one-to-one -one relationship to the states, for example. You only have a matrix of real numbers that may or may not correspond to anything in particular in the physical world. So obviously that is also a problem in science because we would like to gain uh, understanding. Huh? We want to add new knowledge instead of uh, only solving a problem or classifying something in a perfect way. There is also the problem of bias, which we are also all aware of. And it is not only concerning for science, but in general. And, how, and there are many uh, proposals to how to deal with bias. So these are some ex examples of uh, where we are. So we, this is where we, where we are, where we, where we were four years ago. And we, I'm going to show also a little bit more recent examples. And this is not related only to uh, this Microsoft uh, tool, but in general, um, there, there's still some misclassification that for us will be obviously not the, uh, the, the, the ground truth. But for machine learning, it still gets uh, things uh, wrong uh, quite often. In the first case, for example, this is not completely crazy. From the distance, actually, it looks like a cornfield. Right? But this one is much more difficult to uh, justify how this could ha have come as a as shoes or, or an airplane. Uh, but perhaps more interesting is uh, what you are obviously already familiar with, which is uh, all sorts of attacks, including one pixel attacks, which is like kind of the most one of the most simplest attacks. And then when you have all these images um, classified correctly and you, you just flip a single pixel, for everyone would agree that the image is still the same. But then what you get from the um, ML model is something completely different and, and at a high certainty. So obviously, ML is operating at a very different uh, level and, and way to uh, human minds. And there has been obviously a lot of uh, research on how to use, for example, uh, guns, uh, adversarial networks, to minimize all these uh, problems. Uh, and, and this is equivalent to augmenting the data, because basically what you are trying to do is to generate uh, fake images that then you uh, used to retrain your uh, discriminator. But still, you cannot do it uh, in, in a systematic way to avoid all these possible attacks. And so it is some sort of a patch to the real problem behind. And this is a more recent example. If you were thinking, oh, that was a state in 2017, this is still happening. And with, with higher resolution images and still one pixel attacks, you can change things uh, dramatically. And obviously, there are more sophisticated examples where you still have the same object, for example, a school bus, and you just change the angle uh, or the position of the object, and then the model uh, gets it completely wrong, where for us, it is still obvious that it is the same object. And again, uh, the message here is that no matter how much data we have, we cannot completely solve these problems without generating some sort of um, the equivalent of a mental model. Because imagine uh, trying to then cover all possible objects and all possible angles. So we are talking about uh, a num an infinite number of possible cases. So this is a perfect example where big data doesn't solve the problem. We need to think more about the methods behind and put some effort in actually getting the methods right first. This is another example of uh, having different objects that then you overlap and individually you may get them uh, right, but then when you combine them, again, the neural network model uh, gets it uh, uh, wrong. And even just replacing one thing with the other, the original one that was behind gets miscl misclassified. So there are also some uh, a lot of literature on how you can fool, uh, for example, a convolutional neural network. You just add some noise. And for us, it looks exactly the same. Right? This is the same uh, bus, uh, school, school bus. But then you add some additive uh, noise, and then the neural network gets get completely wrong and with a high confidence. 
And actually, we uh, showed in a paper that in general, when you use uh, loss functions uh, based, for example, in entropy, you can always, uh, you can actually mathematically prove that you can always fool a uh, statistical approach. Um, and that's why we need to move to, towards more model-driven approaches. So this is one of my favorite, favorite examples because there are all sorts of neural networks that uh, get um, cl classifying cats and dogs uh, very well with very high accuracy. But when you open the black box and you do some experimentation, because actually you can kind of understand what is going on inside by performing some experiments, it turns out that your model has um, picked up the wrong features. So in most cases, for example, these neural networks were uh, getting right at classifying things that were outdoors. So they were mostly uh, picking up on the grass, for example, instead of the, the animals. So there are some promising approaches. Uh, one uh, for which I have mixed uh, feelings, but I think it is a good progress, comes from uh, Max Tegmark's uh, group, which is symbolic re regression. And basically, you start from a library of equations, and what you are trying to do is to reconstruct the original um, equational model for a piece of observational data. And I think they have, they have done a good uh, work, but obviously the interesting case is when you remove that uh, library altogether, especially if that library was already uh, picked for the kind of data that you are looking at. So um, I think the world is moving towards what Judy Apparel a few years ago suggested, that we have to uh, teach um, AI models to deal with cause and effect. I, I don't particularly think that Judy Apparel's uh, approach is what we call uh, causality in physics, but I think it's, it's still uh, a great step in the right direction with his interventional um, calculus, for example. And there are groups that are basically trying to combine these two worlds uh, using the best uh, capabilities of both sides because neural networks are great at classifying and representing data numerically that then you can compute with. But then we have the symbolic computation power that is pretty good at, at things like um, inference and even arithmetic because uh, that is another great example of things that you cannot really do with neural networks, right? Even simple arithmetic because you cannot show the neural network all possible operations. So we have been working on these topics and uh, we have, for example, this paper on causal deconvolution and nature machine intelligence. And we have been applying this in various domains in biology, including nucleus and positioning and genetic regulatory networks with some uh, success. And actually we even tested ourselves in a com competition for revenue prediction completely unrelated to academia. And we were able to come uh, back uh, first against some large players. So in AI, in science, we have the same kind of uh, problem. Uh, still training, um, <clears throat> instead of requiring a lot of data, model-driven approaches actually require less. And this is an, an interesting case with uh, driverless cars. Eh? These companies um, pushing towards driverless uh, um, driving um, compete on how many millions of miles they have uh, run their uh, cars. And for me, that is like, like the opposite direction of intelligence. And for me, a more intelligent car will be the one that requires less million of uh, miles. But we are kind of walking in, in, in the opposite direction sometimes, not trying to prove that actually our AI has the greatest amount of data, when in reality, I think we should be focusing on less data and more models. So again, it's related to understandability. We need model representation to make progress in science. A great, another great example is AlphaFold. It, it did a great job at perhaps even solving the whole uh, folding protein problem. But one open question is whether we gained any understanding from the uh, 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 result itself. I know we will perhaps, no, but there's a lot of human in the loop uh, doing most of the understandability job. Again, explainability, it, it, as, as it is for um, non-scientific application, also for science is key, as I said at the beginning, and also um, bias. So I'm going to let uh, Ross now um, the, the second part of the... Okay, uh, thank you, Hector. Uh, you can control the slides. Sure. Instead of me loading up again. Okay, yes, I wanted to now sort of... Uh, 
take what Hector said and looked to the to the future. This is I'm involved of uh, my colleagues Hiroaki Kitano and Yolanda Gill and forming this uh, Nobel Turing Grand Challenge. The idea of this is to uh, build by the year 2050 uh, an AI robotic system capable of doing Nobel Prize uh, quality science. And its uh, motivation for this is to sort of push the frontier of AI and science. You know, we want to, it's uh, generally a good idea to aim high, I think, you know, it's, uh, uh, and uh, and I think it's worth thinking what if actually we could do this uh, by 2050, you know, then we would be able to build and make hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of uh, systems able to do noble quality research, which is at the moment, you know, there's. Uh, of course, the Nobel Prizes are competitive, but you know there's there aren't that much Nobel Prize quality research done in the world. You know, so it would transform uh, science and it would transform the world. I think if we actually could do this. But what's missing for this? Uh, next slide, please, Hector. Uh, there's a huge number of technical challenges uh, before we could ever achieve this. Uh, uh, such a system would have to make a strategic choice about research goals at the moment uh, when we have AI and science. The humans are making all the strategic decisions. Uh, systems would have to be able to make form exciting and novel hypotheses. Uh, at the moment, they're mostly just variations of uh, existing hypotheses. Uh, we'd have to design new protocols and experiments to test the hypotheses. Uh, at the moment, systems uh, can only do basically formulated bits of science. They can't design a new experiment uh, from scratch. Uh, You'd have to be able to noticeize and characterize a significant discovery and um, be able to communicate it to human beings to get them excited about it. So now that's uh, in practically getting a Nobel Prize, you need to be able to convince your fellow scientists that this is uh, a groundbreaking piece of science. Uh, so there's still a very long way to go to achieve that. Uh, next slide, please. And there are some even deeper questions, you know, uh, if you look at the past, what, what are the sort of things a machine would be most easily capable of doing? Uh, and I think there's a very deep question that to achieve Nobel Prize winning quality science. Uh, do we actually need to uh, have general purpose AI to do that? Or is it like playing uh, a game like chess or go where and if you look at the, what people thought 30 years ago, they thought that it would take general purpose AI to beat the world champion at chess. It turned out to be uh, not the case. You, we could build special purpose machines. Uh, and what, what AI technologies will be required to get better? You know, Hector has described the existing state of the art. What, what else do we need to do? And how much deep domain knowledge do we need? And Hector touched on that as well. So the final slide, Hector. Yeah, so I, I think there, my personal view is there's this continuum of ability in science, just like there is in chess and go. And what happened in chess and go is what the machine started off playing very bad chess and very bad go. But as computers got faster and uh, better technology and better, they got better at playing the games and eventually beat the world champions. And I believe that's true in science, that there's a continuum of ability between simple forms of science that we already have machines that do of doing up through the type of science that you and I can do up to the, the grand masters of science. And if you accept this uh, argument, then I believe that computers with faster hardware, better software, better, uh, more data will drive the development of ever smarter robot scientists. And 10 years ago, the physicist uh, Nobel Prize winner, Frank Vilcevic, is on record as saying that in 100 years time, the best physicist will be a machine. And I think the Nobel Prize challenge, the Nobel Turing challenge, says we can do that in less time. 2050 is the target. Okay, and that's like to thank you and Hector for uh, for your attention. Great, great. Thank you very much for Hector and Ross for staying on time. Hector, did you have any more slides or is that is that that's the total? That's the total. 
Very good. Okay, so they've set the scene, uh, a very broad scene about what's clearly wrong and with black boxes and 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 obvious uh, misunderstandings. The fact that these neural net deep neural networks don't understand anything, they can actually make good predictions in some cases, but you need to worry about errors and so on. So um, what I'd like to do is open the floor up to questions and discussions. So if you can use the facility uh, either in the chat or uh, on the, the Zoom uh, raise hand. So let me go first of all to, to Jim, Jim Spora. Uh, off you go. Uh, yeah, I would like to um, uh, just briefly, if I can rearrange my screen so I can get into the proper mode. Um, thanks, Tony, and thanks, uh, Hector and Ross. I, I just want to um, briefly state that I think, you know, this was an excellent uh, summary. I think Tony really set the scene with the team science and open access is the goal with the future being scientists plus AI. And I think uh, Hector nailed it with the deep fragility, you know, getting beyond data methods and needing mental models. Um, the causal deconvolution work and neural symbolic AI direction seems sound. Ross's grand challenge for science uh, you know, to me, that's going to be a science team plus AI Nobel Prize winner. And I, I'm, I guess that would be the question to Ross is how does he see um, that Nobel Prize in 2050? I, I believe it's going to be, uh, you know, as uh, Tony and Hector alluded, a, a science team plus an AI. I don't think an AI alone makes any sense for winning the Nobel Prize. Um so I'd like to hear that. But I thought there was a long list at all the stages of the science chain that uh, Ross quoted out. And I, I find this point he made about, you know, is is this AI scientist going to be like chess, very special purpose, or is it going to require general intelligence? And um, so I guess I would, you know, the question for Ross that I'd like to circle back to in just a minute is... Um, does he agree it's going to be a science team plus the AI? And I think um, two other limits, though, that I think are important for us to keep in mind in the discussion today is, uh, you know, the Moore's Law and computing power cost limits. And if I can just show this, this is, um, you know, this is a version of Moore's Law. You know, you've got the cost of computing here along the vertical axis, and you've got the years here. And you can see that, you know, our human brain is estimated about an exascale, and we don't get to an exascale at $1,000 till about 2060, assuming Moore's law uh, continues. Um, of course, if Moore's law continues and these trends continue, the, you know, GDP goes up. But I think in addition to the cost of computation as a limit uh, for AI progress, um, a lot of the advances in deep learning that we heard about couldn't have happened without the increase in computing power, increase in data availability. I think the next challenge is still going to be increase in computing power, but all of this, um, uh, at least all the research I've seen so far in neural symbolic AI requires much, much more computing power. Um, so that's going to be a limitation, uh, foreseeable limitation. Um, the other limitation, I think, is just, um, and it's been brought up uh, throughout this uh, workshop, is just, you know, we are very, very far away from having AI capabilities that are anywhere near general intelligence, and that's decades away. And one of the ways, uh, I'm retired IBM, one of the ways that IBM, I was leading the open source AI at IBM uh, for the last five years, um, we look at the leaderboards and we can really see that, you know, we're just beginning to get to human level capabilities and perceived world. But when you get to human like episodic memory, isn't there at all. Uh, common sense reasoning. Some people claim, you know, the, the latest largest deep learning models like um, the Megatron Turing, it has some common sense ability, but I, I'm less optimistic that that's, uh, going to be useful for real common sense reasoning. I, I agree with Hector. We 
we've got to get the model based in there, not just the uh, symbolic. So, so we're years away from that. And then, you know, to be part of a team, and Tony, I really loved how you started with science as a team sport. It totally is a team sport. And I think until we really get AI with these earlier capabilities, it's going to be hard to imagine an AI with social interaction skills, fluent conversation skills, and how do we get AI to fill the role of an assistant in science, a collaborator in science, maybe even a coach, because teams include younger scientists and and um, there's a coaching capability that I can imagine AI solving. And then um, I think in Ross's talk, he talked about making strategic choices that we trust. And I, I think that's getting into the cognitive mediator. So I'll stop there, but just um, maybe ask, uh, starting with Ross, uh, is it going to be an AI all by itself, or is it going to be a science team plus an AI? Uh, that will win the Nobel Prize. Okay, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, so, you know, I have a uh, uh, connection with, I'm a professor at the, in Chalmers as well as in Cambridge, Chalmers in, in Sweden. So I hear rumors about what the Nobel Prize, what happened. So DeepMind are already agitating for a Nobel Prize for AlphaFold uh, for their work, which is, uh, which would be, as you say, a team of scientists with uh, using AI as a tool. Uh, the goal of the Nobel Turing Challenge is uh, to make a system, an AI system, autonomously able to win a uh, Nobel Prize without a human team. That's that's the grand challenge. That's the goal. You say it's impossible, but I, I don't know. Let's we shall see. Most things in AI eventually are done. Getting the timeline of when they will be done is the hard part. You know, it's, uh... Maybe Jim was suggesting that it is impossible because uh, of the Nobel Prize rules. I think it has to be awarded to people, so they will need to change it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, well, that's okay. They, if you look at the actual rules, it says it should be a discovery in the previous year. <laughs> they already ignore. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, could I just ask, ask Jim, uh, at IBM, you know about Moore's law, of course, uh, and uh, Moore's law in its present state is, is, is running out of steam. You can still make smaller uh, transistors at the moment, but you're soon going to be down to atomic dimensions. And the only way that the US labs have got a hope of getting to exascale is not scaling up by faster uh, smaller microprocessors, but actually by going to these accelerators like GPUs and special purpose chips. And so um, I remember the argument for the singularity was just assuming Moore's law goes on for the next 50 years. Well, it's not going to, it's going to change. And so I wonder what your comment was on that. Yeah, that's a great uh, debate topic, Tony, <laughs> that uh, maybe when we all get to the OECD and have some cocktails that uh, really Indeed. will make for us, we'll... Uh, We'll have a great discussion. Yeah, it's, you know, it, you, you've got gray hairs, Tony. I've got gray hairs. How many decades have we heard that Moore's Law is going to run out? And, you know, it hasn't. Even if it slows down, which I think it will, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking it's going to slow down a little, but, but I think there's innovations we haven't even conceived of yet that's going to keep it pretty steady. Even if it slows down, it just pushes things out a little bit. And I think we, we always have to remind people uh, of the limitations of the cost of computation, because it really is getting that cost of computation down that allows us to make the big advances. Deep learning would have never happened without that. Deep learning was very predictable. I remember talking to Jeff Hinton in the 1970s. I was in an AI startup in the 1970s after graduating from MIT, and we could we could predict when, you know, <laughs> this is about the point when we we're going to be able to train these neural models that people have been proposing for decades, but we just don't have the computing power. Similarly, I think, Hector, your neurosymbolic stuff, all the um, reading that I've been doing is it's an extremely large amount of extra computation power. There are some things I think Ken Forbes has shown me where maybe it's not going to be such extreme compute power, but um, most of the work that's happening at MIT that I'm following um, looks like it's going to be massive amount of extra compute power because the model-based stuff, if you're going to put it, you know, Jan LeCun 
wants it to be, you know, differentiable. <laughs> you know, you got to be able to differentiate it, and it's got to be mathematical, and that's going to require massive amounts of computation to get the neural and symbolic together. Maybe there's approaches that I haven't seen, but it looks to me like the biggest limitation is going to be the computing power. And um, yeah, Tony, sorry for the long answer, but I'm I'm pretty bullish on Moore's law continuing because I have great faith that we've got innovations uh, coming that we haven't conceived of yet. No, uh, it, it's possible, but I'm worried about the fact that the frequency, clock frequency is all already slowed down. So you used to be able to make them smaller, faster and cheaper, and now you can still make them smaller, I'm not so sure about the cheaper, but 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 you can't make them faster. And that's the reason they have to use these specialist chips. But could we hear from others? I have some other hats up. Uh, Jesse, could you um, come in and make your question? Right. Thanks very much for the uh, for the presentations thus far and the questions. Um, so just for background, um, I'm a theoretical physicist, uh, but I'm wearing a new hat now as director of a new institute, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And uh, if, if you had asked me four years ago, uh, I would have said of all my friends who are doing deep learning, like, oh, what's all this deep learning stuff? You know, I'm a theoretical physicist. What I do is deep thinking. Um, and, you know, now the joke's on me that, that I'm a director of this institute. Um, but for me, I had to be convinced. I had to be convinced that AI was the future of science and that I should invest time in it. And it took, in my case, graduate students kind of pushing me in that direction. And now when I'm trying to advocate for the fusion of fundamental physics principles, which gets to what Hector was talking about in terms of model-based uh, work. And he also uh, mentioned my colleague, Max Tegmark, who has been you know, pushing hard on me on thinking more about symbolic regression. Um, but I needed to be convinced. And for example, something that's been challenging to convince my community is that AI could actually do uncertainty quantification. Um, and when you see examples like these confidence numbers with very high confidence, you mislabel images, that basically makes my colleagues think that AI could never actually get error bars correct. And my background is as a theoretical particle physicist and in our field, discovery requires five sigma. And basically the, the, the claim is that how could a machine ever actually rigorously define five sigma? Um, so, you know, one question I have uh, to Hector, um, maybe also to Ross, is about this question of uncertainty quantification and where we are there. And then just more generally, what are the barriers to scientists basically being convinced that they should incorporate more AI into their into their research? Yeah, that is a great question, Jesse. Uh, so I agree completely with you uh, on the statistical machine learning uh, side is uh, virtually impossible to think in these terms and i'm hoping on the model driven side we are going to start being able to tackle this but i think it's too early stages to actually get there it is mostly i think on the fundamental science and, and model driven hasn't really delivered as much as statistical machine learning and that's going to be a problem and hopefully something we can start uh, delivering in the next few years ross any, any comment uh, well, a technical one, actually, on uh, particle physics. It seems to me, uh, as an outsider, that uh, so the sort of five sigma thing is a bit of artificial. And uh, the reason that you know they believe in the Higgs boson is nothing really to do with uh, what happened in the particle accelerators. It's more to do with uh, uh, the basic theories and uh, a missing piece in the puzzle of it all. You know, it's. Uh, I read the actual, or looked at the papers, which had classical statistics, when basically it was a Bayesian argument, which they were really, the physicists believed in. But that's, uh, to the bigger question of uh, AI and science, I think it's just that uh, it's such a good tool, uh, which is so general purpose, it can be applied almost anywhere, to almost any part of science. That's why it's uh, been so successful and so prominent recently. And I. Uh, I think uh, most scientists and their training need to learn about it as, as part of their, their tool, just like learning about bits of mathematics. Yeah, I agree with uh, Ross. Ross. Somehow we can reverse the question and ask also how much we have been relying on uh, weak statistics in science. Eh? So I think we, don't, we haven't really got it right ourselves, so we are perhaps asking too much to statistical machine learning. Just to respond to the kind of the technical issue, I think you're right that our field um, uh, with five sigma, that that's kind of an artificial threshold and you can kind of ask where that comes from. Um, but one of the issues which 
I hope that AI can address is there's, you know, our, we, we talk about two different types of uncertainties. One is pure statistical uncertainty. Um, and that's something that I think, you know, you, you can use classical statistics methods for, but the other one we would call systematic uncertainties. That is cases where you have either mismodeling or misunderstanding, or there's something about the data collection, you know, something people might call this bias. Um, and that's one where if we could find a way of automating that process of quantifying these systematic uncertainties, that would be a great boon to our field. Um, but we're all trained at a young age that systematic uncertainties requires deep domain knowledge. Um, and so the idea that deep learning could take over that is, 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 is a challenge to our field. And so if we could find examples of AI being able to unearth or, or quantify these systematic effects, that would be really powerful. Mm -hmm. Just just to comment on on, on the Higgs boson uh, in re replicability, CERN has two different experiments, and they actually were forbidden to talk to each other. And they actually did elaborate things to make sure when they announced it, they didn't know what these other announcements. So they didn't actually reproduce what one had done. It was two different experiments, and that's a slightly different form of replicability and also of uh, uh, you know uncertainty quantification two experiments anyway uh can i go to our next talker uh, uh speaker who uh is odd eric gunderson can i go to you Odd? thank you very much uh tony uh yes and uh it's uh, uh Good thing you you address or sort of applicability. So um, I spend most of my time in industry and re renewable energy. But but when I don't, I, I ponder uh, reproducibility and and scientific methods. Uh, and uh, and first, I would like to thank you all for a very interesting talk uh, and being uh, invited here. Um, and I I would like to to sort of uh, agree with uh, Jim Sporer. Uh, that I, I think sort of a uh, Nobel Prize will, uh, from an AI will only come as a team member. But uh, uh, because there are so many things an AI would need to do that, so what will we uh, require from it? Uh, creativity, it would uh, need common sense, it, it would need general knowledge learned from books. Uh, and uh, as we as human beings learn, uh, I think also it needs to interact with the environment. and and. Uh, and use uh, the tools that we use as scientists and not only manipulate information. And, and then I'm thinking that an, an AI scientist should understand what knowledge is and what new knowledge is. And, and we as scientists, uh, as, as you are aware of, and I'm very aware of is that even we don't really, we're not able to capture what new knowledge is. And when we see this from, from all the, the, the papers out there at that high, impact journals uh, that is not reproducible and we thought we found new knowledge but we didn't do it and and uh, I don't remember who mentioned that that um, Google and DeepMind sort of are arguing that that they should have a Nobel Prize for this uh, the, the the DeepMind the the, the uh, alpha fold and and then it, it set me out and this is what I want to uh, to ask you about okay so when does AI transition from being a tool, such as a microscope and a telescope, to being this partner? What is the type of, of, of value it has to add to the scientific discovery before we agree that it is actually a part of the team uh, providing this knowledge, not only searching for patterns? So, so if you could please, uh, uh, I would really, understand what you think about this. Thank you. That's very good. Ed. So uh, Hector, Ross, one of you take that one? Yeah, so um, obviously I don't claim to have the answers, but at the, at the end of the session, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we are going to give a talk on this topic precisely. And, and we are going to come up with, with some sort of classification of how to quantify that transition. So. I don't know if Ross wants to add something. Well, there's an interesting uh, legal question, which is uh, which the uh, unpatenting at the moment on who who or what can be an inventor of uh, a patent. I don't know if you've been following it, uh, but in uh, in Europe, it's been decided that machines can't be inventors uh, because uh, basically because they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they don't realize they're an inventor. There was some sort of 
But in uh, South Africa and Australia, they have they're now allowed to be inventors uh, of patents. Uh, and in Britain, actually, it came as two to one uh, on the judges <laughs> deciding against it. Uh, uh, one of the judges thought that machines could be the well. <coughs> A patent didn't really need to have a human inventor, they argued. It could be just blank. Uh, but yeah, so it's the legal scholars are on the case. Yeah. And I don't think uh, Rosa or I were suggesting, by the way, that AlphaFold should be awarded the Nobel Prize. I think Ross was suggesting that there has been some discussions perhaps at his university. Well, uh, yeah, I'm sure the deep mind don't want them to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they want it for themselves. <laughs> Okay, Could I, I go to Google Research then? Alexander, you have your hand up. Do you want to uh, make some comments? Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> um, so to, to give some background about myself, I, I, I sit in <coughs> Google Research and I spend most of my time thinking about uh, causality and in particular what aspects of uh, causal relationships we can learn about uh, from, from observational data. Um, I think one uh, you know very important uh, factor to consider here when we're thinking about artificial intelligence as uh, playing a role in scientific discovery is uh, this question of identification that's really at the center of, of causal inference. That is, whether uh, even if we could perfectly understand all of the stable signals in the data that we've observed, whether we could map those patterns back to actual causal structure um, and to, or you know, for the physicists in the room, uh, into uh, you know, a uh, patterns that are stable under different kinds of intervention, um, and you know, here I, I think that uh, you know it's it's very possible to generate a number of counterexamples where you have systems that model observed data extremely well, but uh, can actually represent fundamentally different explanations about how those observed data came to be. Um, so as an example of that, uh, many of my colleagues and I uh, put together a, a paper recently showing that in a number of different AI systems that are currently used in image classification and natural language processing, uh, processing electronic health records in uh, medical image classification, um, just by altering the random seed that's used to initialize the, the weights in the network or uh, determine the order in which data are fed into the network when it's trained, uh, you can arrive at uh, different solutions to a predictive problem uh, that process the data in systematically different ways. Uh, and so I think that this also speaks to some of the, the systematic uncertainty that, that Jesse was speaking about as well. Um, and so one, one of the, the questions here is, as we start thinking about relying on AI systems uh, to extract these uh, sort of scientific insights from, from the data that we're collecting, uh, how do we make sure that uh, you know, the, the solution that's extracted from there is sort of the uniquely scientifically insightful one and not necessarily one that is uh, relying on stable but ultimately spurious signals? Okay, thank you, Bert. You, you don't want to make a comment about your collaborators in deep mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm, uh, I'm in a great position to, to comment about uh, the, the deep mind folks. They are, uh, they're, they're actually quite separate from the, uh, from the, the Google research side. So whereabouts are you based in Google research? Uh, so I'm, I'm part of the brain team, uh, which is uh, sort of dispersed uh, all over the world. Uh, my particular office is, is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm, I'm right across the street from MIT. All right. So you can talk to them afterwards. Great. Yeah. Um, Good. Can, uh, I, can I ask a question to uh, Alexander about this? I mean, yes, so when yeah. you have multiple solutions to the same problem, um, and you know they have basically the same number of parameters, uh, and you can't use kind of an Occam's razor like like argument for one versus the other. I mean, as a scientist, my, my initial reaction to that is saying, well, those are two valid descriptions of what's going on, and of course, we'd like to know which one is correct, uh, but then that could be subject to you know future experimentation on it. Um, it, it sounds like you're taking a different viewpoint that that you you view this as a as a as a problem uh, that in one shot one should be able to come up with kind of a unique hypothesis even if the data might uh, kind of point to multiple different models that could have the same explanatory power. Oh, uh, so no, I I think actually 
I, I, I love this idea of sort of, uh, you know, uh, trying to narrow the space of hypotheses that are compatible with what we've seen to date, and then uh, developing experiments that help you sort of narrow down the, the set of hypotheses that are still compatible with, uh, with what we've seen so far. Uh, so I, I, I don't think that one shot is necessarily the, the most important thing. Um, but rather the, that we should be aware that the, like, if, if we think about AI as we have it implemented today as specifying a space of hypotheses and then using observed data to narrow down that space of hypotheses, um, what we've seen so far, even with the massive data sets that we're using to try to train these AI models, um, is that that space of hypotheses that's compatible with the observed data is still extremely large. Uh, and so finding efficient ways to narrow down the hypothesis space to arrive at scientific truth, I think is, uh, or, well, to the extent that we can talk about scientific truth, I don't want to get into a philosophy of science debate here, but yes, uh, you know, to the extent that we can narrow that down to high quality hypotheses, I think is, uh, that that's one of the, uh, that's a major challenge and one that I don't think has really been addressed very well by the, the current state of artificial intelligence. All right. Thanks for the clarification. Um, could I go to Mohammed? Uh, you had your hand up at one point. Yeah, sure. Oh, I wanted to comment on a few points, but maybe maybe since we were talking about AlphaFold just now, um, I should say I'm a computational biologist by training, and I've, I've written a little bit about AlphaFold and the developments over the last few years. Um, uh, you know, the questions are isn't about you know, should DeepMind win a Nobel Prize, or you know, what, what, what is the relationship between this and you know, is it a humans or is it, is it a team sport or, or, or what have you? Um, you know, as a domain expert in the space, I mean, I, I do actually think the development of the system is worthy of a Nobel Prize. I mean, it's certainly been a grand challenge in the field for about half a century. And, and they have, I think, solved it to the first order bit, so to speak. So, so from that perspective, I, you know, I think it very much is Nobel Prize worthy. Um, you know, I suspect, given kind of the state of AI today and the way this was done, you know, it was very much, you know, you know, human doing the heavy lifting of thinking about the algorithms, the architecture, and so on and so forth. And then, and, and humans doing the heavy lifting of collecting the data over the last five decades, and then essentially, you know, sort of putting the two together and having a system that is fundamentally a kind of a pattern recognition system, a system that's trying to understand, you know, relationships between protein sequence and structure, sort of, you know, extract these patterns and then, and then, you know, distill them into a kind of a computational primitive that that is then, you know, that that is alpha fault essentially. So, so I think if a Nobel Prize would be awarded, is going to go to the humans in, in this case, and, and and I think the. The, the, because the learning is, is in some ways, you know, very kind of very sort of circumscribed. It's really about the, the patterns. What I, and so, so I think that's sort of a, a different thing than than than, than um, what, what Hector and Ross were talking about. To me, what what I think could potentially sort of be something that would lead more to the, the, a serious consideration that the AI itself ought to ought to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, would have more to do with kind of volition, right? With 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 a with a system that really gets at that very kind of first bullet point, uh, which is you know, does it can it frame the question that it wants to see? Can it frame you know, set of hypotheses related to that question, and so on and so forth? You know, I don't think anybody would go in alpha fold actually came up with the question, right? It's the humans who came up with the question, and they sort of designed the parameters of the experiment um, as as a sort of a machine learning kind of uh, let's say proxy expert, I, I, I think it's conceivable, certainly within the next couple of decades, that we would have a system that's capable of doing that. And I think if we do, then at that, at that point, the questions having to do with, you know, ought it be the, the, the machine versus a human that actually, you know, gets that prize become, become valid. Um, but, but, I, but I suspect in the, the off-fault context, it, it is worthy of a Nobel Prize, but it's really more the humans who, who, who are likely to kind of be, uh, be seen as the ones that, that deserve that credit. Okay, thank you for that. May um, I say something about it? Yes, of course. The questions are to you. Uh, yes, I, I agree it is worthy of a Nobel Prize, uh, Mohammed, but it will be an interesting one because even, uh, and I think Demis Hassabis was very um, modest about it. He said that basically anyone could have achieved this with the resources they had. So what would be the reasons for giving the Nobel Prize because it would appear like it is then given because they have the human and financial resources to conduct some sort of experiment like this one. So well, uh, they are hoping questions. I mean, I, guess, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, well, I mean, I think that may be a false modest. <laughs> this is fine. I mean, it's possible that other people did, but but I, I certainly think that they've they've 
made sufficient innovation and sort of uh, you know advances on on the methodological side that I, I don't think it's a, it's a it's a given someone else would have been able to do it possibly but I don't think it's uh, so obvious. But, but Hector, you see, I, I, I showed the picture of the cyclotron. That was the machine that was needed to get to the energy to make an antiproton, which won the Nobel Prize. So you're saying that shouldn't have won the Nobel Prize because it wasn't fair because they, they no. had. No, I, I'm I'm asking the question because actually it was uh, reproducible with other methods. So the University of Washington also replicated the alpha fold results or with different technology. Also, I think they were inspired by alpha fold as well. It, they didn't replicate the alpha fold results. They did a much simpler problem, but, but they have done. They've used the same sort of techniques. It's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, can I say something? Yeah, because I. Yeah. I uh, did my PhD on machine learning and protein starch prediction uh, 35 years ago. Uh, uh, I think uh, yeah, David Baker probably deserves a Nobel Prize as well uh, for his. He was the leader in the field for for decades. Uh, it's one of the reasons I gave up because it seemed so much better than me at it, you know, and had access to uh, uh, a wet lab, which was one of the things which I think deep mind don't do rightly. I think I, when I spoke to them, I suggested, you know, you need to get into the lab if you really want to do if, 35 years ago. The problem was actually not what they have solved. The, the problem was, uh, like Max Perutz said, like this exam question in Cambridge for the year 2030 or something, make a protein that uh, puts, uh, so a polymer, which has AB, AB, AB or something like that, you know, design a protein to do this or that. That's not what they've solved. It's something a bit different. But yes, I suspect they will get Nobel Prize probably sooner or later. If you want to put some money in it, it'd probably be a safe bet. Okay, so I have a couple of speakers. Odd, you want to come in again, but I on the same topic or a different topic? Uh, I, I just wanted to comment on on uh, what uh, Alexander and, and Jesse talked about and, and sort of reproducibility and 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 uh, Alexander raised sort of the you, you changed the random seed and 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 suddenly you have different um, uh, different results and, and Jesse said but uh, that uh, if the data tells you uh, that there are different solutions here then it, maybe they all are solutions but but there is very interesting thing here to understand is that when you if we're talking about deep neural networks uh, at least uh, you have the data you have the deep neural network with the structure the, the architecture of the uh, the deep the, uh, neural network you have the optimizer uh, you have the hyperparameters and um, the sequence that you feed the data into uh, into the algorithm um, and you have different hardware okay and if you change one of these, you will get different results. So what, what I would say is that I think that, and this is a problem that many people don't think about, that the results we get from neural networks, they are so random, they are so stochastic. We did a very simple experiment where we had the MNIST and we ran it on different platforms and, and, the, uh, and we had different random seats uh, on, on this. And we, we said that, okay, we, we should be able to say that they come from the same distribution when we, we measure this, that they get different results, but they should have sort of the same mean over the, the accuracy. But we weren't able to get that. So we saw that, oh, they, 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 it seems like they don't come from the same distribution. So we cannot say that even though it's the exact same code that executes this algorithm on the exact same data, we cannot say that they are equally good. There are statistically significant significant differences in the result. So, so, so even though we knew the only thing we changed was the, the ancillary software, the operating system and the hardware, and we got, uh, we couldn't say they, they were the same basically. So. No, that's very interesting, yeah. Any, any quick comments before I go to another speaker? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, if I could just uh, make make one quick comment there. I think you know this the, this fragility that, that we've been talking about. I think Hector also uh, referred to some of this fragility in, in his talk. Um, right. It, it sort of highlights the the importance of actually setting up the the uh, you know the, the training problem that, that we use to, to train the AI, um, which I think is still sort of lives in this this world where uh, humans are designing how uh, you know all the uh, how you know, the, the actual experiment is set up. I think, you know, 
Mohammed was was mentioning how uh, one of the main innovations of AlphaFold was, uh, you know, just setting it up such that a predictive problem was exactly what we needed to solve um, in order to solve the problem. Um, and and to me, this is still where the sort of greatest insights uh, are coming from in terms of where AI is actually meeting science. Okay. Uh Reinhold, can I can I come to you in in Leuven? Yeah, uh, I'm just a poor economist. I'm not a technical mm -hmm. expert on AI, but I want to come back to a point that also was already raised by Mohamed and uh, also by by Jim. So I really like this quote that AI won't replace the scientist, but the scientist who uses AI will replace those who don't. Um, and if I bring that to the noble. Uh, Turing challenge. Uh, for me, the question is, is then very much which scientists will be able to use AI to create the next breakthroughs in science, in biomedical or in um, chemistry or physics or whatever that will actually be getting the Nobel Prize uh, here. And uh, in that respect, I'm a bit missing in the whole discussion, the extent to which it's not just only about creation of AI from the supply side, but also from the use side uh, here. Uh, so who will be using this? And so to which extent is there also, um, are you also considering what the limits would be of AI, but more from the, the, from the, the side of the users uh, here? So starting more from what scientific challenges there are, and how could AI contribute to that in complement with uh, scientists as well here? And I mean, does that power AI or does that further limit the use of AI? <laughs> so that was what I, I wanted to know. Okay. So uh, Ross, Hector, which one of you wants to take that one first? Well, certainly, well, Hector mentioned the, the amount of resources which uh, DeepMind could throw at uh, the problem. You know, it's is more than the rest of the world combined, uh, an order of magnitude probably, you know, the amount of money they spent. Uh, and that gave them a huge advantage, you know. This uh, is the, the computing resources that they had access yes. to. Yes, uh, which is, they're not available money. in the public domain, you know. Uh, after the uh, original work with uh, DeepMinded on Go, uh, the EPSRC, the, the British funding agency, uh, went around asking British scientists, why didn't, wasn't it done in a British university? And the answer was the amount of money which they spent on the problem, uh, uh, which was a game. We would never have got that through the res, uh, through a grant, you know, in the public domain. That's uh, so. There are lots of economic questions about fairness and the future of science. You know, if 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 companies have orders of magnitude more research funding uh, uh, than in the public universities. Yeah, and we may see a transition just as we see with uh, ML conferences now uh, being taken over by uh, private companies. Maybe we are going to transition also the Nobel Prize to being given to private companies because they have their resources. And I think it is not only computational, they move at a very different speed because they also pay uh, much higher. They can bring uh, uh, pe people from universities and we see that happening all the time. And it is not necessarily a criticism, I'm just uh, pointing it uh, out uh, that there's going to be a transition perhaps as uh, in, in response to the question who is going to get the uh, prices and, you, and be able to use this AI um, a risk or a opportunity, uh, whatever you want to say it, is that actually private companies are the ones that are going to be having access to that technology. Well, in the US, the NSF have tried to look at this. How could you make US computer scientists, you know, compete with their colleagues in industry? And they are looking at providing, you know, significant cloud resources, which are coming from industry, the same resources that the computer science in industry run. So I think we need to see how that works out and whether that's something the European Union might want to do or, or whether that's something that in the UK they might want to do. Because I think there is an issue about how we can get comparable resources if those resources are really needed to get the results that, for example, DeepMind got. Mohammed. Yeah, I just want to get, make a quick comment about this question in the context of Alpha, which is what I'm familiar with. I, I actually think the computer resources are a little bit oversold here. I mean, I mean they definitely use sub substantial resources, but they're not ones that, that would be outside the purview of a well-funded academic lab. Um, oh, yes, so they were, oh, yes, they were, as I understood it. It was literally, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on computing. 
Yeah, which, which is not, I mean, for, for a well-funded NIH lab, I mean, a million dollars is not, is not a big deal, right? So, but, but, the, but the issue, I think, more honestly, is the, is the um, engineering resources, the software, the human resources, right? It, it's the issue that, you know, that, that, that being able to sort of hire full-time engineers, professional engineers who've been, you know, at it for decades and who could, you know, execute in sort of very high level, at a very high caliber. Th- that is, I think, what's missing in the kind of the academic context, right? Because typically it's scientists, postdocs, PhD students who come there for a few years and then they, they move on, right? So it's, it's that dynamic that's very different. And I think the national labs in the U.S. try to address to some, to some degree, and that, that may may in fact be kind of the, the model moving forward. Um, so so, so I, to, to me, at least without fault case, that was really the, the great limiting step. Okay, um, I see that uh, my directive is, is, is hand is up. Alistair, do you want to say something? <laughs> if, if I may, and like uh, Reinhilde, um, I ask this as an economist, not as someone with any expertise in data science. And I really just like, maybe ask a couple of questions and, and seek, clarification um, or explication in a way which could be amenable to a lay audience. So maybe I could ask um, uh, or Eric, if you could just sort of untangle why is it that the results from application of machine learning to certain tasks you have found to be so stochastic, as you put it, you know, not even part of the same distribution for the for the same task. What? So maybe you could just uh, say a few words on that. That's, that's number one. Then maybe I'd ask a general question really to whoever wants to take it, and that's about the role of accidents and very small sort of outliers in science, because we know that there've been many almost like step changes in scientific discovery as a consequence of accidents or scientists just spotting some kind of strange, very small outlier, which provokes a what's happening there sort of query. Now, in a world where science is increasingly run by pattern recognizing machines, um, are those outliers just likely to be washed out in the system? Are they going to be missed in ways that uh, they might not have been, you know, in a pre sort of AI world of science? That's one question to whoever wants to, to react. And then maybe again, just in terms of perhaps you could provide a few words to explain to a layperson this point that you've made uh, a number of times, Hector, about and others, about the importance of integrating a sort of model-based AI into machine learning systems. Um, does this relate, how does this relate to the point which Ken Forbes made yesterday, time and again, we were, we were talking about language-based discovery and the need for uh, databases, like knowledge bases, where you'd have annotated um, scientific claims, you know, being whether these are truthful or, or non-truthful. Is that the same as, a, is that the, uh, are those the building blocks of the sort of model which you have in mind? Um, so yeah, thank you. Okay, so, um, well, why don't we start with the, your first question to Ard Eric. Do you want to comment on that, Ard? Yeah, I can do so. So, uh, so I, I try to. So, so for each, uh, so when, when we try to evaluate a uh, deep learning algorithm, we give it a data set, and, and then we train it on this data set, and uh, and we see that the random seeds that we use they highly affect results. Uh, so, so we did this on on <clears throat> on state of the art imaging algorithm, uh, where we where we ran it hundred times with with the um, uh, with different uh, seeds, and we saw that results varied with two to three percent from the best seed and the worst seed. Which means that if you have this type of, of change in performance, even if you're the high eighties on nine, uh, the low nineties in, in performance on the on the imaging task, then you would sort of rank from best in class to very far down the list. Um, uh, and and it's also about these parallel computations. So so uh, you, you, uh, the, the way that you uh, combine sort of all the um, uh, the, the computations uh, when you do this ma- matrix uh, multiplication or addition and so on, it will change the results if you do it in, in parallel. Uh, so we are used to thinking about computers as uh, deterministic. Uh, and they are on CPUs uh, typically, typically. You can even have them run uh, deterministic on GPUs, but but what you'll see it, you'll get the same result every time deterministically for your computer, and you'll find that if you do it the same operation 
exact same cold, exact same same uh, random season, and everything, you will see that it's you get a deterministic result, but it will not be the same uh, that you run on a that you get on a different uh, GPU. So, so uh, I think these uh, these two are the main points here. There. The, the randomness uh, so that you you draw random num uh, uh, different random numbers from the the same uh, distribution but the sequence of these random numbers highly affects the result yeah. okay that's uh, i think an interesting challenge um hector do you want to take the next one which is how you uh, would envisage integrating model based ai with machine learning which jesse may want to say something about that as well but over to you, Hector. Yes, um, I, I wanted to say, um, to answer two of the questions that Alistair asked. So one is language-based uh, modeling and model-driven approaches. Yes, I think it is uh, pretty much the same, but I would say the model-driven approaches uh, include uh, language-based uh, um, understanding. So it is a superset, uh, but I guess that's pretty much what um, we were covering uh, yesterday. And when it comes to what you called accidents, which I think could be related to serendipity in science, which I think is key, absolutely key, mm. I think it's going to be one of the main uh, discriminators to tell whether AI is contributing to science. So we will be perhaps high in the uh, hierarchy um, level of AI contribution in that scientific discovery. So also, I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover a little bit of that uh, by the end of the day. A any other comments on on any of Alistair's questions? The role of accidents. Would we have discovered penicillin using AI? Well, robots know. do make mistakes, just like humans. They drop things, and accidents happen. Uh, one of the uh, difficulties which the AI system would have, which I've experienced in my career, is trying to persuade other people that these serendipitous things that you found are actually real. And uh, that is how you, you get an AI system to that when you know, I'm a human. I have some insight into how humans work, and I still completely fail to convince people what, what I'd find was real. It's, it's, yeah, that's an interesting question. Yeah, so robots make mistakes, but I think the interesting question is whether they would recognize it as an opportunity. Huh? So to reinterpret re 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 data and backwards. Well, well, even if they did that, could they actually persuade anyone what they found was interesting? You know, that's... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I think to that point, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the big challenges that we have now uh, with, with machine learning systems is that often we can't tell whether the signal that a machine learning system has picked up is uh, you know, sort of a truly structural signal or whether it has sort of picked up a very subtle indicator of something like a batch effect or uh, some kind of sampling bias in, uh, in, in the training data. And so, you know, to this point of whether you could then use that, the results of the machine learning system to convince somebody that this is actually uh, a, a genuine signal. I think that is uh, one of the big challenges here as well, right? As you see, when you see a machine learning system that achieves better than human performance on a particular task, um, it's often very difficult to tell whether it's because the machine learning system has cheated or whether it has made a, a genuinely new discovery. Uh, and developing better ways of distinguishing those two things, I think will be, will be critical. Um, and one might actually think about those signals that allow a machine to get superhuman performance as uh, <coughs> sort of qualifying as, uh, as uh, say, an accident. Okay. So following up a, a, a bit on that, just in some sense, these, these three questions are related uh, in the sense that when one has models, uh, and if you trust those models, uh, that forms a type of regularization that can control some of the stochastic behavior. And it also can give you more confidence when you find an outlier that that outlier actually um, uh, represents something real. So I, I see these as kind of all, all, all sides of a, of, a, of a common thing moving towards this more model-based or motivation for moving towards this more model-based picture. Okay, we've heard a lot about the, 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 the frailties of deep learning, which I absolutely uh, agree and adversarial noise and things like that are really serious issues. But um, nonetheless, 
they're used routinely in industry for all sorts of things. You know, it can be for just improving Google search. But of course, that's not a life critical thing. If you don't get everything right, it doesn't matter. So is that the distinction that if you make mistakes in some of these uh, industrial applications, it doesn't matter? So you don't worry about these things because they're widely used, deep learning methods, all over industry. Well, yeah, Alexander, it looks like yeah, you're the question. only person to answer this one. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I think that there are there, there are two things to, to consider here. The first one is that uh, in the way that we train deep learning models right now, uh, there is built-in validation, right? In terms of right, the the sort of the secret sauce that holds. Uh, that that has made machine learning so effective in industrial applications um, is, is our ability to validate that the model actually is going to predict well um, in the narrow settings in which we've trained it. Uh, so one reason that we've been able to use uh, these sorts of models so much in industry is that we just have streams and streams of data coming in where we can validate whether the model is working well and course correct if it's not necessarily working well. Um, now, that's not necessarily the case in, in a lot of scientific applications, depending on the cost of data collection. Um, but that, that's one of the, the main mm -hmm. things that, that makes it possible to, uh, to, to use models in industry. Now, one other aspect of that is that, uh, you know, we have, that there's often a way to uh, specify in a single metric what we want a particular model to do in industrial applications. Um, but again, that's not necessarily the case in science, where we would like to arrive at a hypothesis where if you look at it, uh, you know, if you apply that hypothesis to a completely new setting, it provides valid predictions, right? And um, right, right now in industrial applications, we might have models that would make very different predictions on new settings, uh, but end up making very similar predictions on the particular setting where we actually want to apply the model. Um, Right. And so in, in some sense, we are training models such that even though there may be instability inside of them, uh, on the particular dimension on which the model is going to be applied, uh, the predictions are rather stable. Um, so like one, one of the, the ways to make the leap into more scientific applications is that we need the instability that's in these models to not matter for uh, the, the places where we're going to rely on the hypothesis to make a prediction in a new setting. No, I think that's that's right. Uh, any other? Uh, I'll, I'll, Eric, just the. A bit, I noticed that we're overrunning. I'm happy to overrun a bit, but but we should think about wrapping up very soon. Oh, Eric. Yeah, so, so we we are using uh, uh, deep learning in industry to a great extent. Uh, it is said, and, and I just want to warn you that uh, yes, it's true. Um, uh, but for many places where it is used, it shouldn't be used. Uh, I think to a large degree, it's only sort of the, the Googles and the Facebooks and the Microsoft on, on the earth that maybe should use deep learning. For, for instance, when when you, uh, we are doing a lot of, uh, of forecasting in, in where I, I uh, am working and we see, uh, and I think that the industry use deep learning and we see we compare our methods against those using deep learning, but they don't seem to understand that they don't get the best result because they could use other machine learning methods that will provide much better results. And, and we're thankful for that because they are our competitors and, and they, they shoot themselves in the foot and, and we can appreciate that. But, but um, uh, and when you see for in time series forecasting papers, you'll see that they compare against other deep learning solutions and not again, and statistical methods, but not other machine learning uh, approaches such as uh, trees, uh, decision trees that, that are sort of provide uh, much better results, uh, actually. So, so, uh, so I think it's used too much, and people don't understand that they should use it a bit less. Okay, in industry. Uh, I mean, you, you said that, you know the Googles, Facebook, Microsoft, but what about someone like Tesla? All right, so they have semi-autonomous driving, and they have also systems that actually measure how well you drive and score how well you drive, and you can get different insurance rates depending on your score. I mean, they're relying on machine learning and deep learning and things like that. You think that's yes. dangerous? I think it's it makes very much sense for perception problems. So uh, understanding images, and there you cannot use anything better. But I'm not sure I would let a deep reinforcement learning system uh, control my car, uh, to be honest, uh, far away from it. Uh, yeah.
I think we are far, far away from fully autonomous. So, okay, I think we had better wrap up. So I'd like to thank, first of all, uh, Hector and Ross for their stimulating talks, and it clearly stimulated a good debate. And I'm very grateful for everybody. So yes, definitely. Uh, and I'd also like to fight, just like our participant observers who actually participated. And I'm very grateful to all of you for coming and contributing and, and uh, debating and arguing. Uh, and I think that was a very healthy debate. So um, with that, let me just hand over to the moderator, Alessandro Coletia, who's the head of the OECD Science and Technology Policy Division. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. So uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everyone. So welcome back to the session. This is uh, session four. And, you know, uh, as you've heard the, before the break, a very lively discussion about, among all these life scientists and data scientists, and, uh, AI scientists. And uh, now we have a session with economists uh, who, because we're taking it the broader uh, so I think uh, um, if we look at the contribution of AI to productivity in science, we want to discuss now uh, what is in general, what are the factors that influence productivity in science in general, because that we can put AI into context uh, after that. And also, so, so this, uh, this particular session, we have uh, um, a couple of, uh, of guiding questions uh, uh, that um, uh, Alistair uh, put together, uh, which will help us to, to look at the determinants, but also the bottlenecks for uh, productivity in science, because if we have identified the bottlenecks, maybe then AI can help uh, with some of them. Um, so I think everybody, uh, almost everyone will be familiar with the, the Zoom platform. So, but just to, to say, uh, you know, if you don't speak, mute yourself, uh, put, uh, put your video on if you can, it's more friendly. Uh, so that the speaker doesn't speak to a video uh, um, by himself. And also uh, you can um, raise your hand at the bottom of the screen. You have a hand, uh, you can raise it, you can lower it afterwards. Uh, and uh, what we will do is we take three panelists at a time. So uh, after each talk, we just, if there are burning questions for clarification, please raise your hand or put it in the chat. Uh, it's also another way of doing it. Uh, and then we have a general discussion after the first three panelists and after the second three panelists. Uh, and then we also have some uh, invited guests. So you've seen already Marjorie uh, here. She's Director of Technology and International Affairs in at Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, but she's also former Executive Director of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology uh, in the United States. Uh, and I think we also have Stuart Ritchie online. I've seen him. He's a lecturer at King's College London. And we have also uh, online, I think, Gabriele Fioni, who is a regional commissioner for higher education, research, and innovation in France. And uh, in particular, is the chair of our OECD Global Science Forum, who works on science policy. Uh, so, uh, Without further ado, since we're a little bit late, <laughs> let's start with the three first panelists. And uh, so uh, let's start with Professor Arthur um, Diamond Jr. He's a professor of economics at University of Nebraska. Uh, and uh, he's an economist, but he's also a philosopher, I think. Uh, and he has this talk is called Galilean Science, the impediment to progress when science as a doctrine wins over science as a process. So I think uh, we can start with you, Arthur, if you can switch on, if you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I'm going to try and share my slide. So let me push that button and see if I can get that to work here. Are you seeing, seeing my slides? Perfect. That All works. right. Well, I want to thank Alistair for inviting me to participate and also for asking a couple of hard but important questions. I'm going to try to answer one of them. And that, that question is uh, uh, the one about the impediment. What is the most important impediment to raising the productivity of science and why? The answer, just a preview that I'm going to give, is that the most important impediment occurs when science as a doctrine replaces science as 
open empirical process. The um, one question you have to answer before before you get into the main question is what do we mean by productivity? And there's at least a couple of kinds of productivity that matter. One is getting more of the goods we already have. And that takes incremental advances usually. The other is the breakthrough innovations that bring us uh, radically new uh, possibilities. And um, I argue that what matters most, they're both important, what matters most are the breakthrough innovations. And further, there are habits of mind that are particularly helpful in bringing us breakthrough innovations, and they're different. They tend to be different from the habits of mind that, that bring us more of the incremental advances. In particular, as examples, I emphasize alertness to serendipity, uh, clarification of slow hunches, and nimble trial and error improvisations as some of the habits of mind that uh, are common when you have breakthrough innovations. Uh, I want to give one example that has all three of these, and it's a practical example. Uh, this is the uh, innovation of slick water fracking, which greatly improved, increased the productivity of uh, natural gas production. The theory of fracking before this innovation was that you needed to have gel injected into the earth in order to carry sand into the cracks to keep the cracks open so that the natural gas would be able to come to the surface. Um, the theory also said that if you use too much water instead of the gel, you'd expand the clay that was common in shale and that would close the cracks. Well, what happened in one of the uh, outfits that was doing early fracking was Mitchell Oil and in charge of several fracks was a guy named Steinsberger and uh, his crew on one of these fracks made a big mistake. They put in too watery a mix and he was upset and he didn't know what was going to happen. He thought it was going to be a big failure, but he was surprised to find that the output from this well was the same as it was from the other wells. And the bigger surprise was that he found that the, the output continued on a high level going forward after other wells would have fallen off in their productivity. Now, the other people who observed this with him kind of shrugged and said, well, I, you know, flukes happen and they were ready to move on. What was different about Nick Steinsberger is he had a hunch that there, that there was something big going on here, something that might be exploitable and usable and increase output going forward. So he brought it to the comp to other people in the company and said, let's let me experiment. Let me do some trial and error and see if I can replicate this. And he got a lot of pushback. Uh, one of the most credentialed people in the company said, if this works, I'll eat my diploma. But finally, enough people signed off that he was allowed to go ahead at the risk of his career, he thought, and uh, experiment with this technique. And it turned out that uh, it worked. Trial and error experiments were replicable, and he did additional uh, modifications, nimble adjustments in terms of the mix and the pressure and those sorts of variables and got the output to go up even higher. And he radically changed the uh, productivity of fracking at that point. Now, at that point, also, the theorists had to do some scurrying to change the theory to account for what Nick Steinsberger had found. Uh, and then what they choose then came to emphasize was that the shale in which they were fracking was uh, brittle, kind of like glass, so that if you use high pressure watery mix, you're shattering this brittle material, producing a huge number of cracks. And that there wasn't too much clay in it, so apparently the clay wasn't absorbing water, wasn't enough to close off so many of these cracks. Well, so this had the serendipity, it had the hunch, it had the nimble trial and error experiment, some of the keys uh, that I find when I look at, at breakthrough innovations. Um, an innovator who was an early advocate of trial and error and empiricism uh, was Galileo Galilei. And uh, his telescope, this is an early picture of his, his telescope, uh, it was a symbol of the empiricism of Galileo and what I call Galilean science, others call it that too, of course. And part of what's involved in the empiricism is that what was crucial is not that you were a master of the theory or that you were credentialed. What was, what was crucial is that you were willing to look through the telescope and think about what you saw and modify your beliefs based on what you saw. So it was an empiricism with anyone with an eyes and a mind and a willingness to use both could participate. And that implied an openness. Um, you needed to respect arguments and evidence more than credentials. It tolerated diversity, anyone with eyes and a mind. It, it tolerated free speech. The idea was we're not 
privileging theory. We're privileging empiricism. And so how do we get to truth? We get to truth by, by people pointing out what's wrong with our theory and what we should try in terms of our empirical experiments. So this is science as process, a particular kind of process, an empir open empirical process. When we move away from that to prioritizing science as doctrine, that's when the productivity slows in terms of fewer breakthroughs. I'm gonna give just a couple of examples in the brief time I have. Um, I think I've already, I've already talked about this, so I'm gonna move on to this, to the next slide. Science as, as doctrine, uh, in the case of, of uh, William Coley. William Coley, uh, was a, a, is viewed as the father of immunology in the early 1890s. Um, the Rockefellers brought to him a patient who was a good friend of theirs, uh, a young lady who had uh, uh, a cancer and he worked hard to help her with her cancer, but she died about a year later and he was crushed. So he decided he wanted to do something if he had future uh, patients like her where he could be help, more effective. So he dug through the archives in his spare time and he looked for cases where there had been late stage cancers that had been cured and tried to see if he could find a, if there were such cases, could he find a common thread, a pattern? He did find a few cases like that. And he did find a common pattern. The pattern he found was that these cases, uh, many of these cases had severe infections of bacterial infections, high fevers, survived the infections. And as a side effect of surviving the infections, their immune system wiped out their cancers. Well, he thought, get a hunch that there was something important going on here. So what he did was he did some trial and error experiments and gave people, gave some of these uh, cancer patients bacterial infections. They developed high fevers. Mo many of them, it, it, it took care of their cancers. A couple of them died from the infections. So this was a risky experiment. It was condemned by many, including the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was condemned by the advocates of the, what was then the leading doctrine of the time, which was that radiation therapy was the way to cure cancer. He worked at what is now the Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, and he was fired from there in 1925 by someone who was an advocate of radiation therapy. The same uh, person uh, later banned Coley's toxins from being used at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He ended up at a hernia hospital um, and uh, was no longer able to either research or practice his immunotherapy. Um, event eventually the toxins were withdrawn nationally. No one could use them anywhere. Um, and he died a discouraged man. Uh, his daughter kept the fire alive because all these records were in a barn somewhere. And she went through and spent the, the remaining decades of her life organizing them, publishing articles about them, trying to say, there was something here that was important that shouldn't be lost. Uh, Dr. Michael Kinch, who is a, a modern immunotherapist, has written about this. And uh, he says that this canceling, prioritizing of doctrine over empiricism, it set immunotherapy back by half a century. And you can ask yourself how many people's lives might have been saved if this promising approach had not been shut down because of loyalty to what was then the dominant uh, doctrine. A more speculative case is the case of Jeff Hawkins, more relevant per, to our uh, workshop, because what he wanted to do was pursue a PhD at the MIT uh, AI lab. They rejected his application in 1981. What he wanted to do was controversial. He thought that to, to, to do better AI, you needed to have a better idea of how the human brain worked. And at the time, this is his account, uh, it was, it was that at the time AI was based on the idea that the brain functions about the same as computers function. And he said, no, nah, I think it's more complicated. I think, it's, I think there's more to it than that. He was rejected. What he did was he went then into the private sector, created the Palm Pilot personal data assistant and uh, made a whole bunch of money. And eventually he cashed it out and set up an institute to study neuroscience. He did with his own money what he had wanted to do as a PhD student at MIT. Well, he's now, a couple, couple decades later, he's published a couple of books presenting his theories, and I'm not in a position to judge them. Some people, there are people taking them seriously within the uh, AI community. And he believes, and I think he's now working on this, that, that his theories will lead to the better machines that he hoped they would. 
Now, what's important about this is not that I'm sure it's going to work or that it's better. What I think is important about it is that oftentimes breakthroughs come from outsiders and that the current thinking doesn't put very high probability that there'll be success. If there can be alternative sources of funding to allow some of these outsiders to follow their hunches, a lot of them aren't going to work, but a few of them will. And when they do, it's, it takes us enormously further than we would be if we don't allow some of these unusual outsiders to pursue their hunches. Uh, just a couple more examples of where uh, doctrine is, is prevailing over empir uh, empiricism have happened during the pandemic. One has to do with uh, Dr. Camila Rota er early in January, it was in January of 2020, early in the pandemic. She had a patient who had came down with COVID and the only contact she had was at a conference where there had been a visitor from China that at the time of the conference, the visitor had no symptoms. Later on, it was documented that that visitor did come down with COVID. So this established uh, fairly strongly the presumption, uh, Rhoda thought that there was asymptomatic transmission. She and her colleagues wrote up quickly uh, a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, got it published. And then what stunned her, she said she was shaken by it, was the degree of disparagement ridicule that she received to some extent in publications, but a lot of it in social media from scientists and non-scientists alike. It, it, uh, it really affected her. Later on, she was vindicated, but for months, the World Health Organization ignored the growing number of cases after her first case of asymptomatic transmission. And this is a case, I think, where doctrine, the doctrine of what was believed earlier prevailed over the gathering evidence, the empiricism uh, of Rota and others. The second uh, example is the lab leak hypothesis. Scientists are now uh, admitting that they thought the lab leak hypothesis was plausible, but didn't feel like they could say that early in the pandemic. One person who did have the courage and guts to say it was uh, Dr. Lensus, whose picture I have on this slide. She uh, says though that scientists closed ranks against the discussion of the hypothesis. We're not talking about closing ranks against the hypothesis, closing ranks against even discussing it. She says there were people that did not talk about this because they feared for their careers, they feared for their grants. So uh, uh, some people are appalled by this and I think personally, I think with good reason. One of them is Vinay Prasad, a uh, distinguished oncologist. He points out that that when you that the censorship of lab leak hypothesis is an unusual and and a, and a, a worrisome event, and he points out that dialogue leads to truth in science. It's the way we expose each other, the weaknesses of each other's arguments, strengthen our own, or modify them when ours need modifying. If we cut that off, we're cutting off the advance toward truth. We're can, can, cutting off the advance toward innovations and, and more practical effectiveness. He says uh, in a YouTube editorial on this, it's unconscionable that we were unable to have that dialogue. And he's worried, One just one further worry, he thinks this could be a trend, the idea that those who are dominant at a time in science shut down the speech of those who are outliers. And he says, if that's the case, it's a sad day for science and, and for the rest of us too. So what's the most important impediment that I see? The most important impediment that I see to the productivity of science is when science as doctrine replaces science as open empirical process. And why is that? It's because Galilean open empirical science is the underpinning both of advances toward greater scientific truth and advances toward greater technological innovation. So I thank you for listening to what I have to say and I'm happy to hear comments on how I can improve my ideas on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Diamond. Uh, that's uh, quite a provoking talk you made. So uh, as I said, we can take this discussion, general discussion at the end, but if uh, anyone has any questions on this particular talk now, please raise your hand or write it in, in the chat. Uh, I thought your examples are, are terrific. They, they are like, you know, uh, examples of individuals, of scientists. Uh, but today, I guess the, uh, this, the science 
we're doing, uh, we're increasingly needing, needing to do is uh, team science, uh, uh, teams uh, from different disciplines and so on. Do you think that uh, in that context, uh, you know, you would have more outsiders if you want, <laughs> because you're, you're mixing people from different, uh, uh, yeah, background and disciplines. Uh, th this is what is really going on now and uh, and there you know the funding uh, the funding arrangements are um, also supporting this type of science in especially in some countries in, in the US the, this, the whole program on uh, convergent science you know or, or there are others across the world so uh, do you think that this impediment <laughs> uh, will be you now less important in the future well, I'm an outlier on this point because yeah. it is a popular point that a team is is crucial and that all some some people go so far as to say that all innovations result from the cross fertilization of ideas. Uh, that's that's a phrase I think from Matt Ridley, one of Matt Ridley's books. But other people have the same idea. I still think the individual matters. And the one example I gave was an illustration of that. Matt, Nick Steinsberger had a team, but he was at the start. He was the only one on the team who thought that the slick water fracking was worth pursuing. And so if it's a matter of committee vote, he would have lost. But some people in the organization thought that this individual who was passionate about his, uh, his hunch should be given a chance to experiment and see if it works out. I mean, I think there, is, there are multiple sources of inspiration. And one of them is this cross fertilization that takes the team from the start. But I think you also can have lone individuals who have hunches and then eventually they, can, they convince people uh, and get a team together. But at the very beginning, there's a controversial guy, Peter Thiel, who's written a book from zero to one about how do you get breakthroughs? And one of the things he says is, it's not genius or team effort that is the important thing at the start, it's courage. Because a lot of the ideas are ones that individuals have, they, have, they, they see something that other people don't see. They have to convince other people to see it. And uh, we have to, I, I still think we need to allow that. We need to protect that. And and, and uh, not not shut it down. Not say, well, if you don't have your team around you, go away. Uh, because I do, th I still think that the hunches can matter. And I think that some there, you can give a lot of examples from the past history of science, but there are also examples from recent history of science. I, I thought that Elon Musk was crazy when he thought he could get to Mars. I still think he probably won't. But I'm less sure that he won't than I was a lot of years ago. Uh, so there still are there still are these people who got these wild ideas, and occasionally I think if we let them, they can bring us the breakthroughs that uh, help us a lot. Well, Elon Musk had to put the, his money on his enterprise, like Hawkins had too. So they they put the money where they wanted to go, and they manage the risk right. and everything. And that's one of my points in policy, yeah. though, is that we that we shouldn't be too quick to take away all the money of the rich people. At least the rich people are going to spend their money on weird hunches, because occasionally then you'll have more diversity of funding and more chance for outlier ideas to be pursued. And 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 so that's an important point. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so let's go to the, uh, there is already a question for you in the chat if you want to answer it in the chat while we're okay. going to the others, or we can take it afterwards. Let's go to now to uh, Professor Paula Stefan. She's Professor of Economics at Georgia State University and Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. So um, thanks very much for the invitation to talk today, Alistair, to this really interesting group. and. Um, we were asked to, two questions. What's the most important piece of new research that governments um, could, that is an impediment to understanding how to raise the productivity of scientists and how could this research be done? And what's the most important impediment to raising the productivity and why? And I want to um, put these two questions, stand them on their head. So. What's the most important impediment to raising productivity in science? And I would argue that risk aversion, which is pervasive in science, especially among funders, is a huge impediment to increasing the productivity of scientists. And I want to talk about this by giving you some evidence and then some reasons behind why there may be risk aversion. And so let me just. Um, 
begin by um, by talking about some of the evidence. So in some research that I've done with Ray Hilda, who will speak in just a little bit, and Jean Long and myself, we've looked at ERC grants and we find that early career applicants with a history of risky research as measured by novelty are much less likely to be funded. And this, um, this finding is not mitigated if you have high impact research. In other words, having made a big splash does not mitigate the effect of having had a risky um, previous set of publications. And the effect is strongest in stage one, where people are really evaluated on a very short proposal of about three pages, but heavily on their CV, which includes lots of bibliometric data. And then if you look at a study by Kevin Boudreau and co-authors at Harvard, they conducted an experiment at Harvard Medical School, and they looked at proposals and they rated how risky they were in terms of how keywords in the proposal deviated from past studies. And they found that these, quote, risky proposals were much less likely to get good evaluations from peer reviewers. Or Leno did a similar study for the French National Research Associate Agency, and she found very similar results. Or NSF has had a program in the past, it's replaced it by a new program somewhat similar, but it was called the Sugar Grants, and Sugar Grants were for $50,000, and the program officer made the decision, they didn't go out for review, and Wagner and Alexander evaluated the budgets of these program officers and looked at if they'd been spending their funds, and they found that they'd left lots of unspent balances which they thought indicated that they were risk averse. And just very recently, IUB and his co-authors looked at the Synergia grants in Switzerland, and they find over a five-year period, scientists who had a record of risky research were 31% less likely to get funded. So why could this be? Why may funding agencies avoid funding risky research? Well, this is some... Um, things that I've thought about with Ryan Hilda and Kira Franzoni. And these are hypotheses in many ways. But there's, first of all, a bias against risky research in our overall research system. I think that's a big question. And that players within the research funding system are biased against risky research. That's in terms of principal investigators, research agencies, and panelists. So let me just talk about a couple of these. Um, just in terms of the overall system of way in which science is conducted in Western countries in particular, there's huge pressure to show results quickly. But risky research takes time to be appreciated. I'll show you um, a graphic relating to that in just a minute. And yet a lot of career decisions for scientists third year review for prom or promotion, they're based on very short-term bibliometric measures, and that can discourage risk-taking. And we can see this by looking at the citation profile of risky or highly novel papers in this work that Reinhelda and Jean Long and I have done. So these are what, this graph shows if you're a top 1% cited paper, and the blue line is, um, is novel papers, these papers that make these very unusual combinations of references. And we see that in the very short run, they are less likely to be highly cited. And in the long run, they're much more likely to be highly cited. But yet a lot of career decisions are being based in a very short window, and that can really discourage risk taking. And then there's the whole question that's been of soft money positions, what some people call funding or famine. This has been very, very common in medical schools in the United States. It's spread to other departments, other disciplines in the United States, and I think it's a huge impediment. And it's something that we see happening more and more in Europe. 
I mean, just in the United States, most basic scientists at medical schools do not have a guarantee for all of their salary. And as Stephen Quake, a biophysicist at Stanford, likes to say, for these people, it's funding or famine. The incentives are very, very strong that you've got to get funding and you've got to have successful research, and that can discourage risk taking. And then there's a lot of evidence that principal investigators are just not submitting risky proposals because the rewards for doing risky research are present, but they may be insufficient to encourage it. If you look at the citation premium for really risky research, it's present, but it's not large. You can look at the work by Foster and colleagues or Brian Uzi and colleagues, or as we show in the work with um, Jean Long, that the citation premium for risky research is there, but it takes a while to get it. And furthermore, risky research is more likely to be appreciated, or it's absolutely more likely to be appreciated outside your field rather than in your field. And that can create a disincentive. And if we think about research agencies, why may they be risk averse? Well, I would argue that they lack a portfolio approach. They choose proposals one by one rather than thinking about the portfolio of what they're funding. It's a little like buying stocks one by one and putting them in your portfolio and not thinking about what else you have in your portfolio. There's a huge interdisciplinary bias at a lot of panels, and yet we see that this risky research that we identified is much more likely to be appreciated by people outside your field. And then peer review, if you go through like the NIH process, NSF process, they provide little room for uncertainty. Reviewers only give one score and there's no chance to think about that. And there's a practice in many reviewing organizations to look for consensus and that can cause problems. So if you also look at panelists and research officers, panelists have very, very heavy workloads. I mean, an ERC panel member for the first round can easily review 137 proposals. So it's very, very tempting to take a shortcut to, to sort these out. And one of the shortcuts you can take is by looking at bibliometrics. But if you look at bibliometrics, as we've shown in the short run, they tend to be biased against risky research. And also, it's very, very common. I've been on NIH panels. I've been on ERC panels. It's very, very common to look for key publications in journals such as Science, Nature, and Cell. These journals that have a very high impact factor. And in our work, we find that impact factor is negatively correlated with this measure of risk that we have of novelty. So just continuing for a minute about research organizations, funding organizations, I think panelists and research officers are very aware that the future of their program depends on funded researchers not coming up empty handed. And they have limited resources. So they place a whole lot of emphasis on what can go wrong rather than what can go right. Um, and this fuels a heavy emphasis on preliminary results as a necessary condition for funding. Very, very hard to get funding if you don't have strong preliminary results. So in essence, the research got de-risk before it was funded. And the proposed research could be of high value if successful, but if it's weighted by a very low probability of success, it's gonna lose out in peer review compared to something that has a very high probability of success, but may have at best a medium value for moving the frontier. And let me just talk just very briefly about Catalina Carrico. She's a key researcher behind mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. She's the co-winner of the 2022 Breakthrough Prize. But in the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000 um, early, she was absolutely unable to get any funding. 
She submitted more than 20 grants to NIH, mostly. And she says every night I was working, grant, grant, grant. And it came back always, no, no, no. So her inability to support her research on grants resulted in her being taken off even a soft money position at the medical school at Penn. And she was kind of put into a postdoc position that could be funded on other people's grants. And one of the, um, she very kindly has shared some of her rejections with us. And some of the reasons for her rejections included that she was gonna use the grant to pay her own salary, but she was on a soft money position. She had to pay her own salary or that she didn't have preliminary data sufficiently convincing to be funded. Um, now, eventually her research was supported on Drew Weissman's grant that was totally unrelated to mRNA. And we know that um, they played a very key role in creating mRNA vaccines. So the second question, and very briefly, let me talk about what's the most important piece of new research that governments could do to understand how to raise the productivity and how could it be done. And I would argue it's time that we think more about experimenting with ways to encourage risk-taking by funders. I mean, we've got to think about ways to address this strong preference for sure breadth or ways to elicit panel members positive evaluations for high risk value proposals, or ways to overcome groupthink among panel members, or ways to triage proposals into the risk pools and review them separately. We don't need to review them all together. Or ways to incorporate AI into decision-making. I think that's something that at this kind of conference should definitely be discussed and ways to provide early funding for high value possibilities. I mean, Caltech had a model that a faculty member could write a three page proposal, send it to the research provost, and within a week find out if the faculty member got funding to try the idea to see if it would work. Or think more about stage funding. Now, let me just close by talking about an experiment um, that was done at Harvard again, and it was published in Management Science last week by Lene and co-authors. And the paper investigates the role that information sharing during peer review, how it affects other reviewers. And so what they did is they exogenously varied the, rel the relative balance, both positive and negative of other scores, and measured how exposure to either a higher score or a lower score changed a reviewer's score. And what they found is very strong causal evidence of a negative bias. I mean, once you saw that somebody else had scored the proposal lower than you, you lowered your score, okay? And they did not find um, the same thing for favorable scores. Now, why? Well, exposure to lower scores made reviewers think about weaknesses. And exposure to higher scores led to um, discussing non-evaluation criteria, but not evaluation um, criteria. And they conclude that the greater power of negative information suggests that information sharing among expert evaluation evaluators can lead to more conservative allocation decisions that favor protecting um, against rather than maximizing against success. So just moving forward, several weeks ago, the, no the Nobel Prize, and I put that in parentheses, was awarded in economics for experiments, natural experiments. And a few years ago, the prize was awarded for the design of experiments to combat poverty in developing countries. And I think the time has really come to think more about using the experimental tool back to address risk aversion in science. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Paula, for a very interesting <laughs> talk as well. Uh, so I don't know if you have anybody has questions, please raise your hand in the in the chat. Uh, but I mean, the thank you for bringing this um, risk of version element to the table and you know the role of funding organization how these are organized and so on uh, i see that 
uh, Gabriele Fioni from the Global Science Forum has already indicated in the chat um, the link to a piece of um, uh, that uh, the Global Science Forum produced on high risk, high reward research. In fact, now I can see his hand up uh, and also Adam. So, uh, Gabriele, you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, and then uh, thank you very much, Paula, for, for your presentation. Uh, we fully find your recommendation in uh, in the report. We we have a, I, I sent around and that uh, Alexander was speaking about. Uh, I think uh, there is already a bias, and the bias is uh, even the title of this session. We say increasing the productivity of science. Uh, when you want to to have a product. Uh, means that you have a market, means that you have to go quickly. And science, how can I say, has its own times. Uh, you have perfectly underlined uh, the fact that we have to find a way to continue funding, not only high risk, high reward, but especially long-term basic research. Well, I give you just an example. One week ago, I was at the 150th anniversary of a climate lab that was set in France off the top of a mountain. I would ask myself, if 150 years ago, politicians that decide to build a lab on the top of a mountain on climate, would have they done with our criteria today? And for me, the answer is clear, is no. Because nobody was caring about climate 150 years ago. And is there where your example, I think on uh, uh, RNA vaccine, and we can have dozens of examples like that, uh, it's important to understand something that Certainly, we can steer, we must steer research, but we have to accept that a significant part of research will be blue sky. Uh, because the question to which we have to answer tomorrow uh, are unknown, absolutely unknown. If you look at most of the question that global challenges are raising today, if you were thinking that were necessary 10 years ago, you would have never found that. Then mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Uh, and I see uh, uh, Adam. Oops. Arthur, sorry. I, I uh, think you yeah. No, I, I think you've identified a, a crucial problem, and uh, but I don't know about the solution. It seems to me like if you want the governments to fund more risky research, there's always going to be a real problem with getting them to do that. And that's because they can always be made fun of when things don't pay off. There used to be the, uh, was it Proxmire? Senator Proxmire had the Golden Fleece Awards. And uh, the people who are doing the funding, they, they want to continue to get the funding. The, the agencies that give out the funding, and they don't want Proxmire to be able to make fun of them by them funding things that don't pay off. So they're always going to be conservative. I wonder if the more success, like to be successful approach would be to encourage billionaires to say, this is a real problem. Set up an institute where we can have other criteria and take chances. And if you get somebody where it's their own money privately uh, to take a chance, then you're not using the taxpayer's money and you're not having the same kind of incentives. There have been sort of cases like that, like the, I forget exactly what it's called, the Hughes in medical. He donated a bunch of money and they use different techniques. They hire good people and then let them do whatever they want. To some extent, Rockefeller University with medicine tried to do the same thing. So I'm wondering if the way to solve the problem is more likely to be through the private sector than and through somehow trying to get the change of incentives and constraints within the government. Well, well let me just let me just say that um, HHMI sponsored some excellent research. Rockefeller U University had a real preference for risky, edgy research, but an awful lot of very wealthy people create science foundations 
to find one specific cure for something or whatever. And they're very risk averse in lots of ways. Rainhilda and I have a program at the National Bureau of Economic Research every summer where we bring funders together. And it's remarkable when we talk about risk, how risk averse you find that private wealthy foundations are. So I wish that were the solution, but I think that's a little bit of a pipe dream, although there's certainly some awfully good examples out there. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a, is a longer discussion. Maybe we can take it up again uh, after we heard from the last panelist on this uh, session. So is uh, uh, Professor Julia Lane from NYU, Wagner School of Public Service. Uh, Julia, are you online? Yes, I am. Oh, thank hi, you. Julia. How are you doing? Nice <laughs> to see everyone again. Yeah. Um, hey, um, and I, I need to apologize in advance because I have to jump off at 10.40 uh, US time, uh, Eastern time, because I have to go teach a class. So it's, I'm not uh, being rude, I hope, to the people who are going to comment. Um, so that, the, that was a fascinating set of presentations, as expected, obviously, from Paula, who's always uh, very thought-provoking, and, uh, and the prior one as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is, uh, so we've heard about the importance of serendipity, we've heard about the uh, importance of funding risky research. I'm going to be very, very prosaic, and I'm going to say that I think the most important challenge is um, the reproducibility of empirical research. Um, so, and this uh, work, <laughs> interestingly, given both the earlier speakers' comments, is not funded by a uh, science foundation, uh, by a um, federal science foundation. It was funded by uh, massive amounts of money from um, uh, uh, Eric Schmidt and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and the John Overdeck Foundation and so on. So um, the, the notion of philanthropic foundations being able to support riskier research uh, is uh, definitely resonates. Although my collaborators included a lot of people from uh, from from the federal government, so I'm going to talk um, about the uh, sorry about the uh, AI and understanding the empirical foundations of research. So I think that the 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 most uh, biggest challenge we have is the reproducibility of science. Um, and that comes from knowledge creation and knowledge sharing, and it's endemic in a, in a data-driven society. Um, and, you know, we've tried to deal with this with the open data program. Um, back when I was at NSF in 2009, the Obama administration came in and said, well, all data should just be open. Let's force people to make it open. And, and that's, you know, uh, Alessandra, you mentioned we're economists and we all know that in a command economy, when a uh, uh, nail factory is told to produce by volume, you get one big nail. When they're told to produce by quantity, you get uh, a thousand small nails. So what happened was you got a vomit of open data where the agencies just threw data out there. So uh, mandates are not going to work. You've got to try and figure out how you're going to create an incentive structure for people to share data. And right now, the incentives uh, are, are simply not there. So um, there are many reasons why research findings are false. Um, part of it is, uh, and we've talked about some of them, but I'm going to argue at least some of them are, um, are data issues. Um, interestingly, uh, the Biden administration, I thought you might be interested in this given the general focus, um, put in place an AI.gov um, and there's a National AI Research Resources Task Force that um, I was appointed to. And um, they, one of the big foci is data resources. So you, in the previous session, I only got in at the very last bit, but they were talking about massive amounts of data that are, that are being made available. So, you know, how on earth do you create an incentive structure for people to, um, uh, to share and make the data usable? 
right? Because there's only downside risk currently. So, um, and I'm, I co-chair the, the data task force. Um, and so we brought some people in to talk about uh, how, how you might be able to um, build a research resource because as we heard earlier, the a big thing about AI is you have to have a training data set. You, uh, how do you make sure your models are only going to be as good as the quality of the data? Almost all science is only going to be as good as the quality of the data and the quality of the code and the knowledge sharing. Otherwise, everyone's just going to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, we've had a, um, what, what kind of, has been happening is there's been a big push towards data and evidence um, at the federal level. There's been legislation called the um, Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, as well as executive orders um, on, uh, on data and trust in government. And um, we've kind of been riding that wave. We, it turned out we started this um, back about five years ago, where um, I was asked to provide a secure environment to host confidential microdata. And I, I noticed three things. One is building a secure environment was step one. Building capacity to work with the data was step two. But the biggest challenge that I had was when people started to work with data, it was impossible to find out who else had worked with the data. Okay, so when I was at NSF, if I wanted to find out who knew something about a data set, I'd walk down the hall and I'd say, anyone know who's done work with data set X? Now, in Google Scholar, you could go and you can search for articles that are produced on a topic, but you can't go and find what data sets have been used. And so that's, that's the core problem. The search for and discovery of data is... is ad hoc and it's manual. So it's a little bit like, you know, 20 years ago when um, we wanted to go to get a book from the bookstore, we'd go down and we'd find a human being. It's a physical equivalent. We'd find a human being at the bookstore who'd been reading books for 30 years. We'd say, you know, I like this book. Can you find me one like it? They'd kind of walk around the shelves and they'd point things. So Jeff Bezos became a gazillionaire because he figured out how to automate the process of generating recommendations for books in topics or, that were like the ones you're doing. So imagine building an Amazon.com for data so that, you know, when, um, uh, you know, I want to find out what data sets Paul has worked on uh, or, you know, I go into a, starting to work on a on a topic and a, and a data set and they say Julia how nice to see you I see that you're working on topic x here is a set of data sets that are related that might be of interest to you kind of a Netflix or an Amazon.com a recommender approach so how are we going to build that well we don't want to force people to do this we don't want to have the vomit of data uh, that we had in 2009. And this guy, um, Alain Pellet, has written uh, quite um, uh, uh, evocatively on the topic. This is what you get is data.gov that's, that's really pretty, pretty hard to, to use. Um, you know, you get data sets just like the bookstores that describe data by the way that they're produced, not the way that they're used. Okay, so I'm going to use the example because we're all interested in climate change. Um, we worked very closely with NOAA um, on this. Um, you know, imagine if you could find how data sets were used in starting with scientific publications, and you could do any text. If you could do that, you could describe, uh, once you get a data set publication dyad, you can get the authors, you can get the topics, you can get the other data sets that are cited in the pu publication. So you can get the related, you can get the, the data ecosystem and all the metadata that comes along with publications. So I'm not gonna go live because I've, uh, so that's what we did. So this is how the slosh data are produced. What we did was we read 80 million publications 
to find out how the slosh data were used. And we were able to generate an API that creates those data set public, uh, a prototype API that uh, provides that. So if you click on any of these areas, you can find who is an expert in using slosh for boundary conditions, a surface wind, and then you can, uh, uh, you now have opened up that entire um, set of information. So um, what we did, how did we do that? The basic idea here is, Again, I'm an economist, so I believe in incentives. I don't believe in mandates, right? The nail factories respond with the right quantity and quality in response to price signals. So what is our currency in science? It is visibility, right? We will do anything to, 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 to get cited or to, to get highlighted. So if we find a way, and we have the opportunity now with the um, data work, to create an incentive section, that, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to search for data sets and publications. Once we've got that link, uh, we're going to document it. And then value, I know, is a loaded term, but we're going to engage the research community in figuring out how to do that. So the, the forcing event is that the, legis the legislation, the Evidence Act, and the interest of the administration are you know, we're spending a lot of money on data, tell us what the value is. So they now have an incentive and they're required to put data inventory showing use. Uh, researchers, if they put up the use, researchers get credit and publishers can get credit. And that's that's the ecosystem we want to be in. Plumbing's already in place. Uh, there's uh, a data site. There's... Um, that I talked about the AI task force. There's lots of pieces in there. It's just that the incentive structure hasn't been set up. So how are we going to do this? Well, the problem is data site exists, but people don't use it. So here's one example I'm picking on myself here. Uh, this is a data set that I actually helped develop, co-founded the LEHD program. In this publication, I don't cite the data set anywhere in the references. There's no DOI, there's no way of finding it. I, you as human beings are gonna read that and say, oh, this is the data set she's using. There are semantic flags. Up here it says it's in the data section. You as a human being say, there's signals there that tells me that, that they're doing it. So, you know, I could manually read those 80 million publications or I could use AI. So again, with generous money from philanthropic foundations, we, uh, we ran a uh, Kaggle competition. We challenged data scientists to build ML tools uh, to see if they could find what data sets are being cited based on the semantic context. Um, we had 1600, over 1,600 from all over the world um, uh, uh, compete, and they were able to find the data. So here's another example from NOAA. Uh, this, it turns out, you wouldn't recognize this as a data set, but it is. Um, that, so we worked with the NOAA subject matter experts. They gave us a list of 14 data sets that, uh, around um, coastal resiliency, coastal inundation. And we worked with, in order for the, for the competition, it had to be open access journals. So uh, you can see here that we, we curated the, the corpus. These are the data set names. And here is the prediction of the winning models. So you can see here, this is what this team figured out. This is what this time figured out. And this is how they uh, named the data sets that they didn't know were there. They, the training data set was disjoint from the test data set. So they found those data sets purely from the semantic context. Um, I'm not going to have time to go through this, but they actually used three different approaches. The three winners used three different approaches. All of it required some uh, human feedback and generation. Um, we ran a, a conference, and I think actually Marjorie signed up for it. So I'm sorry I'm going to miss your comments, Marjorie. Uh, we had about 500 people show up. These are the three agencies. There are actually, at this point, five that are now involved. I'm going to show you what uh, NSF did because that's 
the closest to, to I think, what people are interested in. Um, but uh, essentially, once we'd built the API, the agencies could pump the information into Tableau or into a dashboard that they could produce. Uh, NSF used uh, a package called Click, which cost them south of $1,000. And it took uh, between 20 and 30 hours of a staff person's time to develop the dashboard that you're going to see. Now, this is internal, but what they're doing here is they're showing their... Um, they're taking the API and they're showing what um, how their data are being used. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, I got the order a little bit out there, but you can see the uh, each publication um, for, from the NCSES uh, data sets. You can see who's been writing on them. You see Paula in there twice. We need some disambiguation. This was just a first uh piece in. Uh, you can see the topics and the related topics. So now you have the ability to build or the core ingredients to build an Amazon.com for data. Now, of course, uh, it's going to be wrong, right? The first time through, we've, we've just heard that machine learning models are going to be wrong. So you want to have the user community engaged to correct. And so building that in is very much part of the, uh, of the model here. So the idea is you put up a leaderboard, you say, here are the um, results that we've got. And then people come back and say, wait, you missed me. I'm wonderful. You missed my preprint. You missed how wonderful I am. Uh, for those of you who are economists, Christian Zimmerman uh, from Repic, uh, obviously, is part of the inspiration for this. And the HCI guys, the human computer interaction guys, uh, are leaning in to help us build this better. Um, but you can imagine how you can build that corpus. So here's the point. You can do it. Uh, we can build an ecosystem where researchers correct it, agencies put it up. We build an Amazon.com for data. And so uh, this conference was in early October. If you want to go on and take a look at the report, we're doing some pilot use cases with uh, GAO and obviously l &B support um, and uh, the CDO council. So that's where we are. Thank so, you thank so you. much. <laughs> thank you so much, Julia. As usual, with your enthusiasm and new ideas. Uh, I uh, went over, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's great. So let's just uh, start with the discussion and uh, until you can be there, Julia, until you have to rush to the, sure. <laughs> to the, to the lecture. So again, here you, you brought up the issue of rep replicability uh, of scientific results and actually big link to AI, how that can be helpful uh, because science is increasingly data, big data driven. So that, that's evident there. So uh, that's, that's any, let's start the discussion and the comments. Uh, so if uh, Marjorie, you want to come in or? Sure. Yes. Sure. And, and I'll, because Julia is going to flee, just, just respond a little bit to, to what she had said, um, because I, I definitely agree on the need for incentives to share data, which is something I've looked at off and on. First, I think it, it needs to be said that some kinds of data, the data that are used in science, um, and Julia gave the examples of, of data shared by governments. There are some kinds of data that might be easiest to share. There's work that I'm doing now that is also concerned with data generated by companies. Um, for example, the Carnegie Endowment has something called the Partnership for Countering Influence Operations, and they are interested in what is happening on social media. So obviously major companies own that data and we have been looking at how one can have a neutral intermediary for, for sharing data that can be used by researchers. So it might not be opened up in the way that I think um, Julia was talking about, but I'm, I, I'm mentioning this as a spectrum. It's not, uh, you could do confidential or yes. private data. It's just that the metadata are open. Yes, not that the makes data a lot of itself. sense. Yeah. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted then to, to move on to address some of the, the broader set of issues that, that came out. Um, I think when, when Arthur was talking about 
uh, empiricism and, and the example of Galileo and so on, and he used the phrase, not that you were credentialed, it did connect back to yesterday's discussion of, of citizen science. And I think as, as the tools of information communication technology get broader, uh, we can provide more tools for more engagement of a broader range of people. The actually, while, while Julia is here, uh, the, the references to cancel culture, I know a perhaps former colleague of Julia, Steve Coonan, uh, is an illustration <laughs> of, of somebody who, who is highly credentialed, uh, but has what I would say are unpopular positions, uh, especially in this administration and, and the Obama administration. But it, it is an interesting case of what does it mean, you know, when you have different people arguing about what what data mean um, in different ways. Uh, I'm not going to put Julia on the spot, but I think there are some some difficult cases that phenomena that are like peer review show that, you know, it's, it's very hard for a contrarian voice to be given its its full airing. The, the theme of private wealth, you know, Julia acknowledged uh, some of the support that she had, for example, from Schmidt. Um, it, it, Paula mentioned that even private foundations can be conservative. And yet we are seeing a slow growth, you know, Kavli, Keck, you know, there were other sort of foundations of the wealthy, Hewlett and Packard, but now more and more, which Schmidt as an illustration are coming in. I, I read a book uh, earlier in the year called The Long Space Age, and it pointed out that private philanthropy is not new. Rich people being interested in science like Bezos uh, and Musk and so on, it's not new. We can find examples from at least the, the 1800s and, and probably Galileo's patrons as well. You know, I'm going to mess up my years if I look too far back in, in history, but there may be ways if we're talking about incentives to get more of that uh, inspiration uh, and, and engagement from private philanthropy that even if it is risk averse, will diversify the, the pool. Um, I agree on the, the politics as a constraint. If you look at DARPA, a lot of people celebrate DARPA as supportive of risk-taking and so on. And yet, beginning in the 90s, they began to uh, demand more frequent report outs, um, more deliverables, and so on. And a number of researchers weaned themselves from DARPA funding accordingly. So there are things that can happen under the covers, just as uh, when it comes to some of the peer review processes and the agency decision-making processes lead to a kind of, of conservatism. So I will leave, um, leave my initial remarks to, to those, especially because other of the discussants may want to say something to Julia before she flees. So, so actually, let me ask Julia one question um, mm -hmm. while, while we're waiting for Stuart to transition. You know, there are some fields where common corpora have been, or data sets have been common. So there, there are textual corpora that are used for um, language work, linguistics work, uh, and so on. There are visual images data sets that have long been shared and in, in these instances, people are trying to perform to a benchmark. And I know that what you were talking about was broader, but I'm wondering if you have any comments about these older uses of, of shared data sets versus some of what we might anticipate in the future. Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, NIST has the TREK conferences, which you're referring to. And then, um, you know, the IRIS visual data set has been used over and over again. And then on my committee, actually, it's been really interesting. Fei-Fei um, Lin is from Stanford, uh, really created a whole visualization corpus. So I think... Um, uh, what we what we really need to do is to create data as a first class asset. If you do that, then you create all the right incentives 
for people to make data available and reusable, right? Um, Because, you know, it's very expensive to curate a data set, particularly the newer types of data that keep getting changed. We used to have in social science, you know, the federal statistical system just handled it all for us. Now we just have masses of data and we have to figure out how to get the incentive structure to curate it. Um, Relying, you know, like on the goodwill of a few nuts like me who created LEHD or Umetrics is not a long-term sustainable option. So it means we're underproducing in that and we need to have the community produce it. Does that make sense? So uh, we can't curate everything. One of the things that's coming up in that NAIR task force is uh, there's so much data getting generated. There's going to have to be a selection and um, how do we how do we do that? Although, you know, Eric Schmidt, and he said this while I was actually at um, PCAST. NYU, uh, oh. and it was during that, that PCAST period, he, he, of course, as, as a, a past leader of Google, was all about just using search, which is another way of saying, why don't we just use AI and technology and not worry as much about curation? So I think a question for you and this group is, is there some minimum amount of curation that is really needed? Or will we eventually be able to just throw technology at any data and well, so, the boundaries. so Natasha Noy at Google is doing a database search. And so obviously we're working, working together. If you were at SIFU last week, we, we put on a joint presentation called Democratizing Our Data, right? So with her database search, she's been looking for citations, but we know that's a vast underestimate of the data for you know, to take a, when we've looked through just a string search in publications, um, even of those fewer than 5% are cited in the, in the data set. So you really have to have some combination of what we're proposing and what she's doing and eventually create the incentive system so people actually do cite it in references and so on. But it's, we're right now in a suboptimal equilibrium. Thanks. So let me just do a little publicity spot for the OECD because we have uh, uh, just adopted in January our OECD recommendation on research data. So uh, we are uh, organized across seven pillars and now we're trying to develop an implementation toolkit. And this, some of these issues are really those we, we are going to tackle with the international community, including data curation, the cost of uh, data curation, how to prioritize, et cetera. So this was my publicity spot. Uh, uh, Stuart, did you want to come in? Yeah, I guess, I, guess um, uh, I mean, this is all music to my ears, this, this last part. And actually, reproducibility was, was, is the thing that I'm kind of focused on. I wrote a book about bias and fraud and science and so on, and the reproducibility crisis. I'm a psychologist by training, and so we have the, the reproducibility oh, right. or replication crisis in our area and all that sort of stuff. So, so, you know, it was great to hear that, and I have a few comments related to that on the first couple of talks. But I guess the, on, 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 on uh, the, 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 the most recent talk, um, I, I just worry that, you know, in, in my field, the incentives are so badly stacked against this. Even, even some journals in, in my field now give you a little badge when you publish a paper that has the data um, made uh, uh, available. You get a little open data badge and so on. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I still think it's a tiny minority of papers where people are putting, are making the data available. People uh, jealously guard their data. I was in a session just this morning where people were talking about how they're worried about being scooped and worried about their data being used by other people and and and, and so on and so you know um some of these ideas are are, are great and obviously it's a very different field you know talking about the the, the ai uh, and so on but um i really am rather pessimistic about creating a, a, a you know incentivizing people to share data and i think it may have to be um an obligation that they, they they are under, you know, with with a funder or something, um, you know. So, for instance, there are some won't funders do it. that they some won't do it. Say again. They just won't do it. Well, or you'll get crap. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. The so. If you don't have the right incentives, you're going to get what you get with data management plans and so on. The federal agencies have, and that you just do the absolute minimum, and no one checks. So yeah. Well, it, that's the problem yeah. is no one checks, and you know we've had this issue with. Uh, 
uh, pre-analysis plans before you know before touching the data. Uh, um, everyone loves to make a pre-registration and say that they've written their pre-registration plan down and so on. But then when you go and check it, it's nothing like the uh, the, the the data that people or the um, analysis that people eventually end up end up doing. So yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I'm I, from the world so, of psychology, I'm, I'm a pessimistic uh, view on, on this. But so the psychology, the, I'm an economist, not a psychologist, obviously, but we have a major um, policy change, which is the federal government, which is 20 to 25 percent of economic activity in the mm. US, depending on how you measure it, is now requiring that these data inventories get put up. So, you know. That's a huge push. So why do Kaggle, we got, why do people post stuff on Kaggle and GitHub? The computer scientists had no problem sharing code and information. In the Kaggle competition, we were blown away by how much knowledge was being shared. Mm. A bit, um, so it really is um, figuring out how to trigger a community. And I think if we have the federal agencies posting information about leaderboards, right? About who are the experts on a particular data set in a particular topic, and you're not on there, <laughs> you're going to be willing to contribute and make sure that as many people know about your data as possible. That's exactly right. Kaggle helps build reputation for data scientists. So we need to do that more broadly for scientists in general. And, mm -hmm. you know, with the federal agencies, if we just try to nibble around the edges with mandates and stuff, it's not going to work or helpful hints. Yeah. Uh, the, but the federal agencies are a good trigger. Relying on people's uh, uh, innate competitive nature certainly appeals uh, to me. So, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Uh, that's, well, yes. Well let, me just make, well, let me just make a comment that when one talks about private funding versus um, government funding, I think that a distinction also needs to be made as to where the research is being done. So um, I think one of the things that, if you, if you think about the slides I presented, one of the holdbacks in a sense of, of doing risky research is the way in which universities are structured and the way in which decisions are made in universities. So I think one of the brighter spots here is not just having private funding, but having institutes or research institutes that are not part of the university system that I think has become very encumbered in terms of supporting risky research. So whether it's private foundations or whatever, I think that's a big issue. And we kind of put all of our big eggs in one basket, at least in the United States for a very long time that most research was going to be done at universities, and yet we impose this structure that I think really discourages risk taking. So just to follow up on that, I think that's a very important point. If you look at U.S. industry, you know, there used to be Bell Labs. Everybody oh. celebrates the old Bell Labs, which was supported by a, a monopoly business model. And then IBM research, um, you know, was one thing and then it transformed into another thing. There used to be research supported by, if I just think about computer companies, companies that no longer exist, uh, like digital equipment and, and so on. So at least in the United States, although we can now point to Google research, Microsoft research, they don't necessarily publish in the same way that AT&T and, and IBM did. So there's a different kind of contribution to public knowledge or maybe a more delayed contribution to, to public knowledge. Um, I, we do have national labs, but one can argue that maybe they tend less to do the basic research that the universities are known for. But it strikes me that in other countries, government-funded research institutes are, are more common, and that might be something mm -hmm. you know, for us to look at or understand better. Yep. Anybody else? Can I um, sort, of, sort of raise a kind of a paradox here, which is in um, 
obviously we want risky research and we want research that gives large rewards and 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 and, and so on. But it, as part of the, the conversation about replication problems and the replication crisis, if you want to call it that, there's been this uh, uh, um, you know negativity towards an obsession with novelty. You know, so uh, journals will 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 only publish exciting novel results, or or, or certainly that seems to be how they're how they're um, how they're uh, they're set up, and we'll, we'll certainly have a bias against uh, you know replication studies, studies that uh, that that just simply do again what someone has done to check the robustness uh, of it. Um, and yet, uh, as we heard from the second talk, uh, people seem uh, averse to, to to publishing research that is that is novel and uh, and and produces you know new exciting uh, uh, findings. Um, th there must be a way to reconcile these because, of course, what we want is novel but also robust research. Um, so I, I don't know what you, what your thoughts are on sort of reconciling the neophilia thing, which people think is 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 bad that we're obsessed with flashy findings published in you know glamorous journals and so on, um, to the to the detriment of reproducibility. And on the other hand, we're obsessed with just you know uh, as we heard in the first talk, you know, kind of kind of um, uh, conformity almost. Uh, uh, um, Rather than, rather than you know pu pushing things forward and 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 maybe hearing new, being open to hearing new perspectives. Arthur, you want to come in on that? Yes, I was going to ask Paula okay. if she had thought at all about uh, prizes as an alternative way to encourage risky research. Um, it seems like that has some appeal, and there's certainly a, a lot of people who are advocating, like with the X prizes, and there was a book about longitude that gave a, an interesting example of prizes. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've never known what to think of the, what do you do about the early stages where people don't have the money yeah. before they get the prize, but yeah. I, did you, yeah. I think the big problem with prizes is that um, they could encourage people to do the research, but you gotta have the money to do the research. So it's a chicken and egg problem. So they're very appealing, but I don't think they're very workable unless you figure out how to seed them with funding For in many instances. Yes, Gabriele? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Yeah, I think it's, if we do not move out from communication, if you do not come out from these horrible cycle of uh, immediate answer to immediate problem. We will never get out. Uh, we are speaking about high risk, high reward. We are speaking about uh, competitive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you look at all problems and all major technological breakthrough we had, that were built on a solid, thick, research that has been done for years and years. If we continue to and get people, give the impression to politicians that, oh, it's very simple, it's like Wikipedia. You put in a, a phrase and you get the answer. Uh, I think at least that is in Europe, okay? I, the system is very different from USA. Uh, I think it's a real duty of government not to win the next election, but to prepare the society of the future. Okay. And that is something where government has to fund not only competitive research, because sometimes we really need competitive funding, especially nowadays where we need a different discipline to converge together where we need funding on discipline that does not exist. That is very, very valuable. But at the same time, we must keep a very, very solid level of fundamental research, letting people going more or less where they want. Okay, I was always saying when I was uh, in another life, I was always trying to keep 30% as blue sky, okay, blue sky research. I do not want what they do. I don't want to know what they do. I will make an evaluation after four or five years to make an evaluation every year. I think it's just time consuming. Uh, 
then they don't need to, my first point. The second point, and I go back to the art presentation. Uh, there is only one thing in your statement when you said, that, what is the biggest uh, impediment that we have, the most important impediment that we have? And then, if I remember correctly, you said that that occur when science as a doctrine replaces science as an open empirical process. I would just adapt maybe the first, but I want really to have your impression. I would say that when politics enter in science, uh, you know, you, you have shown Galileo, uh, the one that were uh, against Galileo and they won, okay, because they withdraw all what they were saying, uh, were not scientists. Uh, certainly, they were getting wrong science advice. Uh, and then I would say we have really to respect the time of science. Uh, it means science is very simple. You have, let me say, the peer, the peer review. The fact that, and you need time. You gave a very good example that was the COVID is originated or not from a lab. Uh, I remember at the beginning, everybody was saying, oh, Trump say that, it's pure politics, don't care. It's pure politics. He wants just to go against China. And, and then pff, there is nothing. And additionally, not only, there were several scientists that they were saying, we made a DNA sequencing and we don't, we don't see any variation on that. And now these people are evolving because they, have this, they are discussing. But again, we have seen in COVID, we need the time. We need the time. You, we cannot ask a science to give the answer in a few days. I'm sorry to, for being long. Thank you, Gabriele. You made some very important points. Uh, now, the issue is that we are running late, but uh, you know, you guys are staying also for the second discussion, uh, so we can continue this conversation. And I think the other three panelists also will touch upon a similar issue. I don't know, Arthur, you wanted to say something? You were about to say something in response? Well, I, I basically agree with what, what he just yeah. said. Uh, and. Uh, that's all I was going to say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, we can take a short break. So uh, welcome back to session four. Um, before the break, we heard uh, from three economies. So we, we have the two guiding questions for the session again. So we the the session the questions were and are uh, what is the most important impediment to raising the productivity of science and why. And also, if you can point out to the most important piece of new research that could help understand how to raise productivity of science. And then we heard from the, from the three previous speakers uh, that impediments are science as a doctrine as opposed to science as a process. So this was Arthur. And then risk aversion. This was uh, brought up by Paula Stefan and repl replicability of scientific results and the whole issue of the data. Uh, by Julia Lane, uh, and uh, only Paul, I think, she actually uh, talked about a new piece, you know, the research that could be done, uh, mm -hmm. like experiments and ways to encourage uh, this um, risk taking by funders. So let, now let's hear from uh, the three next speakers um, about these three questions. Uh, so the first one is Professor Marianne Feldman uh, from the Department of Public Policy at University of North Carolina. Um, Marianne, the floor is yours. Very good. Okay, thank you. And so, um, you know, it's um, hard to come second because so many wonderful things have been mentioned. I really want to think about how we can use AI to dismantle the barriers um, and to promote creativity and collaboration. And uh, we mentioned earlier, I was excited, this um, sort of idea of replicability. And I want to think about the replicability of scientific studies. Stuart started to mention this. 
But we know that in science, the rewards depend on impact factors. And so there is this rush to publication and um, this has create a, created a system where it's well documented that about 50% of biomedical research cannot be replicated. And in psychology, it's estimated to be as high as 80%. And so I think this is more than just the availability of data. I think it has to do with a lot of bad research design and p-hacking, a whole bunch of bad practices that really um, AI can help to weed out. Um, and so, you know, one um, a sort of unfortunate thing is negative results are never published. And I want to sort of return to this idea. I think our publishing models are so inadequate. Um, we now have a system where Google Scholar will show me the whole corpus of research that might be relevant to my work, but I'm not able to access that work because it's behind a paywall. And so it seems that the model that we have of still publishing, going through this long lengthy review process to have things be put out and only things that are very novel and deemed worthy to be seen um, is a problem. And we see with theoretical physicists, specifically string theorists have experimented and put things into online archives. I think there was a mention to this in the first session where um, we now get, instead of just three people giving you peer review, everyone in the community can um, vet those ideas and you can get more immediate feedback. And so, um, you know, this idea that we need to replicate, otherwise we're wasting money. And that um, this has been very true for pharmaceutical companies who have gone forward and found that they have licensed technology only to not be able to replicate it in their own labs. And so um, there is a the very recent issue of um, issues in science and technology has a wonderful article on ending the reproducibility crisis by Brownlee and Bilakova. And so it is just coming out in the autumn yeah. issue. And it really um, looks at the issues of replicability and then argues that AI might be used to address this. And so most importantly, impact factors are what people live and die on. And AI could be used to generate new impact factors. That is, you could remove the negative reviews. Right now, any citation is viewed as a positive citation. If your results are wrong and it generates um, a flurry of activity, that helps your impact. That is really to the detriment of science. Also, we can then look not only at are you being cited, but how original is this idea? What is the contribution that is being made? Um, I want to also say that um, we can use AI to identify talent. And so we all recognize that um, science is increasingly a team um, sport and we, we need large teams of creative individuals and we need to bring together diverse groups. And um, we also know that talent is, talent is sort of distributed through the population. When people identify team members, they tend to go to, well, their former graduate students or they go to people they have collaborated with in the past, people who are in their networks. Yet there may be individuals who are outside of their networks who could contribute fruitfully to ideas. We talked a little bit about venture philanthropy and I, I really do think funding of science is another place where AI can help us, but I'll return to that later. The venture philanthropy example is something that I've studied with my co-authors, 
And Paula mentioned that many of the medical philanthropies are conservative. And I think that is by design because they are really searching for faster cures for specific diseases. And so they are trying to sort of organize resources, not to fund risky science, but to really bring that science forward. And we have been looking at their contractual terms and really understanding um, the what you know how this venture philanthropy model differs from traditional foundations, from government funding, and also from industry funding. And what's very profound is that the venture philanthropists are very good at forming teams identifying in, um, in the sort of corpus of people who are writing on a certain topic, those individuals who might fruitfully work together and then bringing them um, together and then also managing them and managing this process with things like open lab books that allow for much more fruitful collaboration. And then again, this is really very uh, technology intensive. Um, I want to say also where um, I think that we should be cautious is in having AI define the focus of our research. And so one of the, you know, sort of things that's very difficult for a researcher to develop is a taste in good research questions. And it seems to me that AI can also help us by um, providing, if you will, um, a sort of a better understanding of the trajectory of the development of certain ideas and an understanding of how various pieces fit together in these scientific um, puzzles. I want to mention, I think, an area that's really ripe for um, AI, and that is to think about innovations in science, um, not only, well, when we think about innovation in biomedicine, we tend to think about drugs and devices and a place in that is really ripe for innovation and that is relatively ignored, but that so affects the patient experience is service delivery. And service delivery is very poorly managed and we are not funding enough on sort of this process, if you will, and understanding, um, understanding how all the pieces fit together. And some of this requires funding social science research. And really, um, I think that, you know, when we think about applying AI to social science, that gets kind of scary. But when we consider the COVID example um, that Paula mentioned, and I think this is um, Tangled History, um, which is in um, Nature um, by Dolzer, really describes um, that the process by which this research languished for a long time. And Paula mentioned this and is, I know Paula and um, Paula's doing more work on this, looking at Catalina and how her research was denied. This sort of highlights to us the importance of government funding. And then the fact that, um, you know, we after sort of with all this background, 12 months after the COVID genome was sequenced, we had a vaccine. And then we can ask ourselves, well, why is it that we don't um, have, you know, sort of more progress and specifically coming from the US, what we see is that there is a problem with the information that the public gets. And we need to sort of understand then what are the limits to people um, behaving better and getting the vaccine as it's needed. 
I also, um, you know, wonder if AI can help change the culture and the incentives for science. And so certainly replicability is one area that I've already mentioned, but it is also well known and well documented that scientists are on a treadmill. They are constantly having to try to secure funding and they are, um, you know, sort of senior scientists are very concerned about keeping their labs going. And I think that there is an opportunity to use AI um, to really fix the system and to make it easier for um, scientists to use their creativity rather than engaging in the myriad of bureaucratic tasks that increasingly seem to occupy our time. And so senior scientists spend a disproportionate of time, amount of time submitting grants and also then writing reports. And it seems to me that a lot of this could be automated or made easier. But also, and Paula alluded to this, um, you know, why is government funding less research and sort of what are the issues? And we hear a lot about waste, fraud and abuse. And it seems to me that AI could be used to not so much fix the scientists, but to fix the system and to streamline some of these administrative um, processes. And we see that um, universities have become very bloated with administrators and there are a lot of requirements. And so we could use AI to really reduce um, some of these costs and the things that, that really um, make it more difficult to fund research and to, for the universities to cover their fixed costs. Um, I also want to say that I think we have to be very sort of, as we design these systems, to think about um, AI working for scientists rather than scientists working for AI. And, um, you know, I'm um, concerned, you know, sort of, I think data is important. And so data is really now become the oil of our information economy. So data is a resource um, and I think we have to use it well. And so um, with big data, it's really easy to get statistically significant results. The more difficult thing is defining hypotheses and interpreting results. I'm also worried that more and more of the data that I would like to use is proprietary. And again, it is um, it's sort of beyond access. There's a really wonderful book by a labor economist, Julia Shore, and it's called After the Gig, How the Sharing Economy Got Hijacked and Then How to Win It Back. And she offers some strategies for really empowering, and she's talking about gig workers, so contractors, but what we see is with artificial intelligence, skill displacement is moving up um, to higher education levels and higher skilled jobs. And so there is this concern that we will have people working for machines being monitored by AI rather than, um, than working for um, working with us. And I want to sort of was disturbed by the idea of companies getting Nobel laureates and thought really what we have is this monetization of science and scientific discovery. And someone put a, um, a site to um, Nesto's work um, on the privatization of science. The fact that more um, sort of now um, computer scientists are working for industry, then working for universities. And as we think that companies will use this um, to really generate more profits and not put it in, put this, their discoveries in the science, in the public domain where it will benefit everyone. I think that that is potentially a cause for concern. Thank you. 
Thank you, Marianne, and thank you for linking uh, with all the previous talks, also for the, from the previous days. Uh, so let's uh, let's go on with the uh, with the second uh, panelist. So, uh, Professor uh, Miko Pakalen from uh, yeah. Professor of Economics from the University of Waterloo. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, thanks very much for uh, the invitation and for this uh, very interesting uh, conference. And I especially the other other sessions today. The um, now, as the title suggests, uh, um, uh, I think there's a problem in science, uh, but I also uh, have a solution to uh, that I'm going to propose. And uh, the problem relates to what uh, what Marianne was saying. I think Marianne phrased it something like uh, like uh, impact fa factors are what we uh, what scientists uh, live and die for these days, right? Um, and I think uh, this this uh, this aspect of science uh, focus on impact factors has uh, has made uh, scientists uh, uh, invest too much effort in uh, incremental science at the expense at the expense of uh, uh, exploratory science of new ideas. Okay, and um, uh, I don't think we can put this genie in a bottle anymore. I don't think we can say let's stop measuring uh, scientists. You know, we can't say we can measure everything else except ourselves, right? We can't say that. That that, that doesn't work. So in, instead, what we um, uh, I think what we should do is that in addition to scientific impact, which we measure by citations and uh, impact factors, uh, we should also measure uh, uh, scientific novelty uh, and uh, reward scientific novelty. Okay, so that's 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 the. That's the key idea. I'm not going to talk about AI so much. I'll, I'll make one comment at the at the very end. Okay, so so the the background for this um, um, uh, <clears throat> for this idea that we need to uh, reignite science is is this um, observation which uh, I, I don't I don't think it's uh, uncontroversial anymore. I think this was uncontroversial. This I don't think it's co controversial anymore. This was controversial maybe ten years ago. Um, and when people first started talking about this, um, uh, uh, but but I think today it's uh, it's well accepted, well well accepted among I think most people. Oh, although I could be wrong, but uh, but the, so the, this basic fact is that new ideas are not fueling uh, economic growth the way they once did, right? And there are many many different measures uh, 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 we could marshal forward here, but one is to look at a uh, uh, total factor of uh, uh, productivity growth. Um, uh, which which roughly measures uh, um, how uh, how how efficiently we're we're, uh, we're able to use our uh, uh, our capital and labor, um, and, uh, and 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 uh, new ideas uh, make these uh, processes uh, uh, more, more efficient. We, we can use capital and labor more efficiently. And from uh, 1920 to 1970, uh, the growth was about uh, two percent a year. Um, but uh, but lately uh, it's been uh, uh, much less than, much much less than that, right? And uh, this economist uh, Alex Tabarok uh, recently uh, had a had a nice way of, uh, of phrasing this, which is he said that the uh, the fu future is continu continuing to to recede, right? Which is that that the future the the, the technologies and living standards we, we thought we would get um, uh, at any given point in time, uh, those moments are are are. Are uh, are being postponed later and later, right? And so, for example, uh, the living standards that that we ex um, might have expected uh, in 1970 to have in in, in 2021, uh, well, we're going to get that level of technology and living standards uh, after year uh, 2080 now, right? Um, and uh, and uh, this 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 is of course uh, especially a problem for uh, for the uh, less wealthy members of uh, of society, maybe maybe. You know, higher living standards are not that pressing for us, but for many people, uh, they are, right? Um, and so, so, um, so there are many, many reasons for um, um, uh, why this um, uh, total factor productivity growth has uh, has slowed down. And um, uh, one potential explanation, um, which again I think many people believe in these days, is, is that uh, is that scientific product productivity has. Uh, has uh, has stagnated, right? Um, and uh, and so it's useful to think about okay, if if science is not fueling um, um, improvements in living standards the way they once did, 
then uh, uh, okay. So what what determines uh, uh, the the kind of usefulness of uh, scientific production, right? Well, uh, three factors that come to mind are number of scientists, which has exploded. So based on that, we would expect uh, um, us to have um, many many better new ideas than than we got fifty years ago, right? Uh, another factor is uh, fertility of existing ideas. Um, and there are a lot of people who believe that uh, that the the, uh, the fertility of ideas that we work with, uh, the scientists work with, that uh, that has gone down. The uh, the third driver of uh, of the use of, of the usefulness of science is, is how scientists uh, recombine those ideas, right? And um, and so if we, if we leave out this um, um, number of scientists issue, uh, which doesn't really relate to productivity of science at least directly. Uh, then we're left with basically two competing explanations for this uh, scientific stagnation. Uh, one is that uh, good new ideas are now harder to find. In a way, we've, uh, according to this theory, we've uh, used all the uh, uh, low-hanging fruit, right? And if this is true, there's really not much we can do, right? Uh, the, I mean, there, there are many, many problems with this. Um, uh, first hypothesis, one is that it's uh, self-fulfilling. Once we start believing that, nobody will fund any uh, explore, exploratory uh, uh, funding uh, applications anymore. Because uh, go to people as well, new ideas, you know, anything um, that looks remotely crazy is not going to work. People are not going to believe in it. Another idea is that is that uh, we've, uh, you know, for centuries people have all the time said, uh, "Look, we can't find any, you know, we can't really find any um, any um, any good new ideas anymore, only to be proven wrong." Uh, um, in a relatively short notice, right? So the other, the competing um, um, uh, hypothesis for this stag uh, stagnation is that we're now looking for new ideas in the wrong way, right? That something has happened to, uh, to how scientists work. And if that's the case, uh, then there is a potential solution, which is that we need to rethink uh, scientist incentives, okay? And, uh, it might it might it, it might seem uh, odd that something has uh, happened to the to how uh, to how uh, how scientists uh, to how scientists uh, uh, work you know what what kind of ideas they choose to uh, utilize and how they co recombine those ideas but we like we already saw for example in uh, Paul uh, Stefan's uh, uh, presentation today um, uh, science how scientists work uh, for example how, how risky uh, um, uh, projects they pursue is is determined by many factors, right? And there's some there there's some evidence um, from uh, biomedical research and from NIH funding that there's been this uh, longstanding uh, decline in, uh, in in novelty of our research, right? So it's possible, it's conceivable that uh, indeed we 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 work we scientists work very differently today than uh, than we did uh, decades ago, okay? And uh, well, why might scientists work very differently? Well, uh, scientist choices are influenced by a lot of factors, right? Uh, constraints like lack of funding, funding or lack of academic freedom, uh, the issue that, uh, uh, or scientific freedom, the issue that Arthur Diamond uh, um, um, uh, highlighted and which I think is, uh, 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 is uh, I'll come back to that a little later, but it's, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, but that's not my focus here. Uh, it, it's also uh, influenced by, uh, by uh, by incentives that from, stem from uh, publishing pressures or funding, uh, um, and from uh, from demogra demographic factors like uh, uh, location. And we know that older scientists work differently than younger scientists, right? So, uh, so, so there are a lot of factors that uh, influence what kind of what kind of uh, science is pursued, right? Uh, now, I, I think uh, in, uh, all, all these factors are important, but I think the underlying um, um, the, the, the one single most important factor that drives how scientists work is how they're evaluated these days. And I think by and large, they're evaluated by citations. So I think the citation obsession is the, is the number one problem um, in, in terms of uh, what kind of uh, science people pursue. Um, now, uh, um, how, how much time do I have? Sorry. So, sorry, you still have uh, six, seven minutes. Six, seven minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So I think I will introduce this. So, so um, uh, I, I think it's useful to to talk about how uh, how ideas have progressed. 
And I think an idea, idea, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity. I think an idea uh, in most cases uh, progresses something like this. First, there's an exploration phase where a, a group of scientists work on some new idea, like CRISPR, right? They have basically no idea what it does, what it's good for, and what its properties are, right? And then uh, after uh, uh, decades, uh, then people uh, people fig figure out, oh, okay, this is what it is, this is what it's good for, um, and that's th then this idea enters a, a breakthrough phase, and then it enters a, uh, uh, an incremental advance later, where uh, the the scientific impact uh, people a lot of people still work on it, and you get a lot of uh, useful knowledge, but but that knowledge isn't isn't this great. So the key idea here is that underlying breakthrough science and incremental science is a lot of exploratory science of these new ideas. And without this exploratory science, we we'll never get these breakthroughs and we'll never get to these incremental advanced stages, right? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, um, a key, 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 key aspect of this, uh, of this, uh, of, of this, uh, of this uh, life cycle theory of an idea is that most ideas are like this idea D, right? They completely fail, right? We figure out the properties; they're not very useful, right? Uh, but uh, but it was important to work on those ideas, anyways, because with, without that exploratory uh, work, we couldn't even figure out which ones work and which ones don't, right? So we need a lot of exploratory work to get at least a couple of ideas that do work, right? And um, and so this what what, what this uh, uh, so before the uh, citation obsession. We had scientists who worked on exploration, on breakthrough science, and on incremental advanced science. But now, um, uh, the uh, because citations, uh, the, the, the easiest way to get citations, the shortest, shortest way to get citations is by engaging in incremental science. Now the incentives are stacked in favor of incremental science uh, 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 at the expense of uh, exploration. So today, um, uh, way less uh, people. Uh, uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, try out these new ideas, and as a result, um, uh, these uh, we find less uh, less less uh, good new ideas. Okay, um, so my my proposal for how to uh, uh, how to counter this is to uh, is, is is to start measuring and rewarding uh, novel, novelty directly. Um, uh, uh, one example of uh, how one can uh, measure novelty is by uh, 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 looking at which publications mention uh, relatively new ideas, and I've, I've written a bunch of uh, papers using this uh, this technology. So I'm uh, I'm I'm at least convinced that this approach uh, works. Uh, and what this would do uh, is that it would increase the incentive for exploration, uh, trying out, and scientific play. And uh, to be sure, we should reward both scientific impact because um, uh, breakthrough science and uh, uh, incremental science is important. But should, we should also uh, uh, reward novelty so that we get a better better balance between uh, um, exploratory science and uh, and breakthrough and uh, incremental science. Um, and uh, sorry, how many minutes do I have now? Sorry, I didn't hear. Two uh, minutes. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. And so, so, so basically, if you uh, so th the way I think about it, this is that uh, is that uh, Google is not good for science. Okay, you go to Google Scholar, and it's very clear how Google uh, 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 how Google values scientists. It's based on um, uh, citations alone. Nothing else matters. And this is you know Google Scholar is by far the most uh, most important uh, uh, resource for uh, for scientists today. This is this is how. Uh, everyone sees that they're scientists, and uh, I don't think we should uh, get rid of Google Scholar uh, uh, or Semantic Scholar. But I, but I think uh, I think there should be a better balance between uh, uh, between uh, um, um, scientific influence and sci and uh, and scientific novelty. So there should, so there should be a separate column um, that that would also give uh, some some measure of novelty for for each paper and for each scientist. Okay, and. Um, um, and uh, so, so just uh, so this may seem, uh, yeah, okay. So, so, so a real quick point is that really this is the, this novelty reformation seeks a return to the path uh, emphasized by Vannevar Bush in the famous uh, 1945 essay. I mean, he emphasized the scientific scientific uh, play and uh, exploration of the unknown, 
I'm pretty sure he'd be astounded if he saw um, how, how scientists are evaluated today. And th so this again, um, uh, this goes back to uh, back to Arthur Diamond's excellent, fantastic presentation. It's interesting that he mentions freedom of inquiry 10 times. And that's really the crux of this whole essay. But I don't think it's often remembered for that. <laughs> um, um, uh, for uh, uh, two fi final points. Uh, um, um, uh, what was it Paula who made these excellent points about the uh, mRNA vaccines? Or somebody did. Um, I'd just like to uh, point out one additional uh, aspect, which is that uh, the co-founder of Moderna um, is very much uh, uh, saying essentially the same thing that I'm saying, although he doesn't really uh, he, he doesn't uh, propose the same solution, which is that he says the incremental advances are the coin of academia today, and that we should consider reforms that foster a culture in which scientific leaps are more encouraged, encouraged uh, uh, even rewarded to some degree. So, so we should uh, so this novelty reformation would make science more tolerant of uh, of this kind of uh, failures that engage. Uh, 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 failures that result when people try out new ideas. Okay, um, and so to uh, to conclude, uh, uh, yeah, we, we should we should I think we should resist the scientific pessimism. Um, that's uh, that's basically the dominant explanation for uh, scientific stagnation. Um, I, I think we should have a very high bar, uh, much higher than 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 we have right now. We should, we should have a very high bar for accepting the idea that uh, uh, it's somehow um, harder now to find good and new ideas than it was before. Okay, I think I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you, thank you, Miko. So a lot of uh, uh, thoughts that resonate with the previous uh, presentations, but well, let's go to Renilde now, uh, she's an expert also in, uh, in measuring uh, novel, <laughs> the impact of novel ideas. Uh, Renita? Yeah, um, I, I would actually like to go back to the topic of the AI technology and how that can actually in increase the productivity of science. Uh, and I would actually like to bring a bit uh, on board um, research that we have uh, in terms of looking at AI adoption by firms uh, and see whether we can draw any lessons from that for uh, scientific uh, research uh, here. Um, so I would like to first uh, give a bit of um, uh, uh, evidence that we, we got from a, a large survey of companies on, on adoption of AI and a um, few of the, the key findings there and then see what we can learn from that uh, also from the scientific um, endeavor here. So the evidence that we've been doing um, and we're looking at was uh, with the European Investment Bank. It's a really large survey of more than 30,000 companies across all countries, uh, US, e, uh, all European countries across all sectors, manufacturing as well as service sectors, including business service sectors, which comes already somewhat close to scientific research, and all, also across all size categories here. And it was um, regularly done, so before the crisis and also after the COVID crisis, so you can also see what the impact of COVID uh, was actually uh, here. So uh, questions were asked about whether they adopted various uh, technologies, including AI, but also other digital technologies here and what plans they had to invest here. So let me give you very quickly some, some uh, noteworthy results. First of all, firms do invest uh, in AI uh, and the COVID has actually been um, an, 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 a moment where firms uh, increased their investments in AI technologies here. That happened in all sectors and in all uh, countries uh, here, although a little bit more in business service sectors. Um, but, and that was already present before uh, the COVID crisis, there is uh, really a polarization going on uh, in, in the um, uh, business community here. Some companies are really uh, persistently lagging. They are, they did not invest in the past and they also have no plans to invest. And with COVID uh, also didn't have any plans uh, to, 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 they didn't catch up and also have no plans to uh, invest in future here. And then you have leading companies. So those that were already digitally active uh, with different technologies and with AI, and those are the ones uh, that are really actually forging ahead uh, with COVID also to keep on uh, expanding their uh, AI technology. Uh, here, So that's really, I think, an important um, uh, result to take uh, home also for the, the science community here. 
uh, this possibility also of AI and digital technologies to become uh, a divide uh, and, and perhaps even a growing divide uh, over time uh, here. And then if we look at, 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 at least at the company side, who these lagging companies are, uh, so those are typically older and smaller companies uh, here. And the EU, unfortunately, has more of those than the US and that, that's uh, holding us back. Uh, once you correct for that, uh, also our our, uh, our larger companies are not less uh, AI adopting here. So there's really this old SMEs, uh, which are a problem in terms of lagging. Um, and what we also do see is that starters, uh, so companies that, that were not investing, but, but really start to invest for the first time, uh, usually also are smaller companies here, but they are not so strong as we would have expected in terms of, of generating enough uh, weight in the economy uh, to really catch up uh, here. And particularly, again, in Europe, these starting uh, companies are, are much too small uh, here. Um, what we also, and I think that's also, again, important also from the science uh, implications, is that these investments in AI uh, seem to go hand in hand with the adoption of other digital technologies here. And I think that's important to stress, too, is that you need really a platform of various other technologies before you can actually take all the benefits from AI uh, technologies uh, here. Uh, so investing in, in other digital technologies and having that platform is very important um, to, to get uh, the, the sufficient incentives to invest uh, in AI here. Uh, and also important is that you need uh, compl other complementary uh, technologies and assets, and particularly management practices uh, here, and particularly for AI. What's very important is to be able to, to make advantage of data. You really also need to have sufficient management practices, data management practices that actually will help you to... Um, uh, to make optimal use of, of AI here. So a lot of complementary assets need to, to, to be in place, digital infrastructure, but also uh, management practices uh, here. And then, of course, what's important is the extent to which these AI adoption also leads to performance uh, and, and performance differences uh, here. We do find, we do see correlation, although causation is always a bit more difficult to, to, to prove here, uh, particularly these leading companies that are persistently investing in digital technologies and that do have these complementary uh, digital platforms and uh, management practices. Those are the ones that also forge ahead in terms of, uh, of productivity here. But I think what's also important to note is that productivity link um, also runs through innovation uh, here. So uh, what we also do see is that those companies that are actively using AI, they're also very um, active in terms of innovations and they use also and AI for the innovative performance here that then translate into better performance. And that um, innovation is not just only process innovations of how to produce better here, but also to produce new ideas and new offerings too. So it's product and process innovation for which uh, AI uh, technologies are being used uh, here. And then I would also like to, to bring on board um, a bit more the macroeconomic uh, evidence on this is uh, like also raised by, by Brynolfsson and others, is that the impact of AI technologies on performance, it's usually not an immediate effect uh, here. So it's a famous J-curve effect, actually. So initially, there might actually be less effects on performance. It, it's only after a certain time that you get really the full returns from your AI investment in terms of performance. Initially, may may actually even be negative because it requires a lot of investments into absorption, into complementary uh, know-how that needs to be built up uh, here. So that J-curve effect is important if we want to look at productivity impact of AI. We really need to, to take a longer term perspective before we see the full uh, results uh, here. And then finally, one other piece of, of evidence I think is useful also for, um, uh, for uh, the scientific community is we also asked in our surveys what uh, firms saw as major barriers for digital technology adoption and AI technology adoption. Of course, uncertainty about returns is very important. That's why COVID also <laughs> was, um, uh, of course, a bit of a problem initially uh, here, creating too much uncertainty. But actually, almost as important as, as this um, returns was access to digital skills uh, here. That was actually mentioned by all companies as a, as a, as a major barrier for adopting AI. And that held not just for the lagging companies, but also even for the leading companies uh, here. It's very much 
um, uh, reminiscent of, of this war for, for uh, IT talents uh, here. Um, uh, what uh, what lessons could we now draw for the scientific research uh, environment in terms of what we've learned from from this um, corporate um, uh, corporate uh, profiles uh, here? Well, first of all, I think this this polarization is is something very important to to consider uh, here. So AI really and, and lots of other digital technologies really have this winner take all dynamics uh, here. So uh, it's really persistency, uh, increasing returns to scale, uh, and scale that that's needed here. Um, and in that respect, AI may not be an equalizing uh, factor here, but rather one that could actually further polarize uh, here. Um, and given that within the scientific community, it's already very heterogeneous, uh, uh, no, sorry, very skewed <laughs> in terms of, of performance here. It so it's, it's, uh, was already very much concentrated on excellence and, and, and winner take all. So... Uh, I think a question for that that would be nice to discuss here too is: Would AI actually lead to further um, further deepen that polarization here, or would it really be, or could it be a, a factor of, of catching up uh, here? Um, and my prediction would be actually it would lead to a further uh, increase of of, of polarization uh, here. Uh, and that AI would be actually for a happy few uh, scientists, uh, scientific um, uh, institutions here. First of all, the, it's the excellence that really have also the higher incentives uh, because they get the higher returns from AI here. They also have higher capabilities uh, to turn AI into uh, results here. They have access to, to larger infrastructure, the, uh, access to larger uh, um, finance, so size and scale really matter, and also might have also these complementary assets, management practices, uh, and, and digital platforms uh, here. So uh, my prediction would be that we really need to look at this that at this uh, polarization uh, here and and um, ensuring that actually how can we actually have the scientific uh, um, community also uh, being able to catch up uh, and, and and avoid the polarization uh, here um Another important implication for, for um, uh, the scientific community is also again this access to skills uh, I think, uh, IT skills is very important. It's not just about having access to the technology here, but also having the people to work with and to implement these technologies in the scientific uh, community. It was already also mentioned before. Is we need a lot more of these uh, of these uh, technical experts on uh, technology on scientific teams here. How can you get these, these critical uh, assets uh, here, given that this is a war for talent? It's a war for talent already in the corporate sector. Um, so um, in that respect, scientific community is not only competing among themselves for these for these talents here, but it's also com competing with the corporate sector uh, here. And that will definitely be, be difficult, particularly for those that would be uh, trying to catch up uh, here, how to get access to that pool of talent. And I think that's another uh, challenge for the scientific community here is how to grow a larger pool of talents uh, here. Uh, of course, education of, of new talents uh, here, but also uh, retraining of existing uh, talents here. How can we do that? Um, also making sure that we keep our uh, science system sufficiently internationally uh, mobile, um, uh, open for international mobility here cross and sector uh, mobility here, how can we move between industry and, and science uh, and also cross disciplines here. So I think that uh, making sure that we get uh, a large enough pool of, of talents here so that that doesn't uh, remain a constraint here. Um, and, and that means just in, in terms of profiles, not just only looking for uh, for the technical consumer, uh, sorry, not consumer, uh, computer uh, skills here, but also the, the skills for adopting uh, these technologies uh, here. So um, not just only the creation of new AI uh, technologies, but also users uh, here. And then finally, on the performance uh, effects, uh, I think um, this J-curve effect is very important to consider here. If we really want to look at the, the implications of AI on productivity, uh, also in science, I think we need that J-curve perspective. And actually, yesterday, uh, I heard an interview with... Um, uh, with uh, the director of, of NIH, uh, 
Francis Collins. And what he was actually saying was something very similar to the J-curve effect that we were actually always looking at. So he said that any, uh, any important breakthrough in science is usually overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term here, which is exactly that uh, J-curve uh, effect uh, here. And, and in order to, to, so what's really important is that we need to take that longer term perspective to make sure that we really get the full returns, uh, uh, in, um, full returns incentives for, for, uh, for engaging in, in uh, AI uh, related research here. But also sufficiently, and that was already discussed substantially before, take enough risk perspective here. Um, and if our system is not willing to take that high risk, high grain, high gain and longer term perspective, we might actually be, be missing in terms of creating enough incentives for a scientific system to, uh, to invest in AI because the performance effects are too risky and too uh, long term uh, here. So that's what I wanted to bring on board for the discussion. Thank you, Renilde. And sorry, I forgot to tell, but everybody knows you. <laughs> you are Professor of Managerial Economics, Strategy and Innovation in the Catholic University of Leuven. So now you up. Oh. It's not the Catholic University anymore. It's now the KU Leuven. We had a whole discussion oh, on the, the oh. university. <laughs> okay. Bl blame Alistair yeah. in the agenda then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kelly Eleven. Thank you. Thank you, Renilde. And for making this uh, interesting parallel uh, between the adoption of AI in business and what problems it can create and how that can translate also to the research uh, uh, space. Uh, we heard from previous speakers about the democratization of science using AI tools. You're talking about polarization instead. And then you brought up the, the issue of skills that others have mentioned. Um, so I think uh, we can open up the discussion uh, for all these three talks and also the previous ones, if uh, we want to follow the thread. Uh, I see that um, Karaj has, has a question. Why don't you ask it, Karaj? So yeah, um, so I, I think that was a really interesting session and it, it identified many sort of systemic issues around science that maybe affect productivity. Uh, incentives, uh, sort of career paths, maybe the way we we fund science, the data access issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the question for me is, if they're the systemic issues, how can AI really help us with those, or to what extent can it? And I heard a little bit at the edges on some of the issues, for example, with reproducibility, it could maybe identify some of the errors in papers or things. Um, but is the do, do people, you know, the presenters or the panelists, do, do you have strong views that AI can actually really help us address some of these systemic issues? Or is it more likely, as was suggested in the, perhaps in the last presentation, that actually it will, it could potentially make them worse? Um, you know, introduce biases, introduce a more polarized system, more excellence only funding um etc um how how do you how do you see that i just have a general comment in response to that question which is if you look at the long term experience with digitization i mean at least back to the the 80s um most business analysts or people who reflected on, on the impact of technology or why it took so long for computers to show up and the productivity statistics talked about the basic need to really think through what you're trying to do, what your processes are before applying the technology. And I think some of the examples that were given today, in a way, were examples of just you know, throwing technology at the, the problem in an easy way. And perhaps that's one way to interpret the concern about Google Scholar that was cited. It was easy to analyze citations, so why not do it? And then that distorts people's view. Um, mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's the best way to use AI. It's just the, the way people are, are doing it because they can. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, 
I think I like to still make a distinction between, on the one hand, how can we use AI within the science system itself and how to design the science system, uh, having better peer review, better selection or whatever. That That's one important uh, dimension. But another important dimension is the extent to which AI will be used by scientists in order to create the new next uh, scientific uh, results here. And these two issues are, are somewhat different, I think, is what's needed uh, is, of course, use of AI to make our science system better, work better, but it's also hard to make sure we get more AI used within science uh, here. Now, this polarization is something that um, that could, is, is likely to take place because of the winner-take-all kind of dynamics here, and particularly in science. But I'm not necessarily saying that that's negative, right? So we really have to, again, see to which extent what what is the optimal degree of polarization and winner take all dynamics that is still beneficial for progress into science here and it could be actually that we would have to live with even more polarization here more concentration on but that's something we really need to carefully look at uh, here so it, so the polarization or or the the, the concentration <laughs> that ai may actually look uh, may actually bring well, we need to, to understand whether that's good or bad for progress in science uh, here. And that's uh, still to be examined, I think. I think that that point connects to something that Marianne said, um, which was basically to beware uh, using AI to define the focus of, of research. Mm -hmm. um, and that was connected with researchers needing to develop taste in, in um, good good research questions. But I think bridging what the two of you said, there are issues of how do you team people with tools? It isn't all or nothing. It isn't all AI and all people. It's how do we combine the two in, in good ways? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. if, if I may, th there was something else that, that Marianne teed up that I think connected to what, what Miko was saying. And in his, his questioning um, novelty in ideas, basically everybody has, has talked about the, the gravitational pull of industry on talent and how people who are outside of, of industry suffer as a result. And there's also a lack of transparency in what can happen because they're proprietary interests. I don't have answers to that. Certainly people recommend rotations in and out, fellowships, externships, you know, reverse IPAs and, and so on. But, but I think it is worth reflecting on this larger nature of privatization of science. I mean, the earlier panel talked about more private funding, but, you know, there is different kinds of, of private execution. And, you know, we could have in an extreme, a caricature, you know, in the private sector, maybe they use more AI um, in their research and we may or may not see that. And in the public sector, if they are more poorly resourced, you know, maybe there is less or maybe there are different uses and that might affect the quality of the ideas that, that we see. Um, I, I just throw that out at the moment. Yeah, indeed. Uh, if I may, uh, uh, Reinhild, uh, you have underlined, uh, you make a clear separation and it's perfect. On one side, we have artificial intelligence to serve scientific advancement and scientific research. And that is certainly extremely useful to reply to the question of Carthage in, in a transdisciplinarity, for instance, where we need plenty of different parameters that come from society, that come from different domain of science. AI can be of great help. Can also be of great help to make a break breakthrough. I give you an example we all share. Uh, I always say biology, is going to be like particle physics, in the sense that we have more and more data, even ourselves, when now we go to the doctor, we have dozens of different uh, examinations that are made, and how can you really find a correlation? 
that one is something that is important, even if we do not have to forget one thing. And that is the link for me with data that we discussed before. We have to be careful. Not everybody, how can I say, has shared our ethical point of view, our respect for intellectual properties. Then before putting all our data on the web, we have to be sure that we have we are at the top level of tools for artificial intelligence, because the one that will have better program to analyze all this data will get the benefit. And very often without, without investing on it, then certainly as open as necessary, no, as open, uh, we open the data, but we have to keep it close as necessary. That is something which is, I think, important. Something that artificial intelligence should never do is to take political decision at our place. Uh, when I speak about careers, okay, when we speak about which domain you have to fund, okay, there is something which is really critical. Uh, you have a machine learning mechanism that can be parameterized just to see the trend of the last years. Again, if we look only at what is going on today, we will be absolutely inadequate to answer to the challenge of tomorrow. That is something that we have, I think, to keep in mind. AI is a tool and should never become something that will make political choices at our place. Then very good to get the data to try to understand, but the final decision, especially in political things, must be the human being. Thank you, Gabriele. I think uh, um, Arthur has been waiting patiently with with his hand. Actually, I actually have two comments, uh, but on the most recent uh, conversation, I'll I'll say first. I think during the pandemic, uh, AI has been shunted aside more than it should have been, at least in the United States. I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but in the United States, there has been a, a, a continued line that the only source of truth are randomized, double-blind, controlled trials, and that any other conclusions you reach from other sources are to be sort of pushed aside. And uh, I understand the theoretical argument for the superiority of that method. But if you look at how it's actually practiced, there, there's plenty of flaws that can come into various uh, randomized, controlled, double-blind experiments. And so the, the view I have is these various methods, observational regression studies, uh, big data, randomized, double-blind, they should we should allow them all. And then it's, a, again, an empirical test which one produces the most truth and maybe also take into account at what cost. And so you don't dismiss uh, the way that I think we've done in the last year and a half, at least in the United States, uh, results of AI and some of these other alternatives and say there's just only one method. We're going to stick to that no matter what. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I do have another comment, uh, uh, totally different, but and I can do that. Do you want me to do that or? Yeah, we can start a new okay. trend. <laughs> this is this was on. Uh, uh, I was sympathetic to a lot of what uh, Miko said, but I I did have one part of it that I I'm hoping he can find some other way of making the point. Selfishly, I want this because I've been looking for it and I haven't found it. And that's where he used TFP for an argument about our decline. And I think there's a good possibility we've declined. I think that's a plausible, but I'm, I'm queasy about TFP as the way to judge that. And the part of the reason I'm queasy about it is my understanding of TFP is that it, it incorporates uh, GDP as uh, as part of it. And I've always, from what I've read and what I know about that, it, that's not a good measure that for capturing uh, the breakthrough innovations that I was arguing are what's most important. And I've seen TFP used in a book that, I, that really bugs me, and I don't know um, – if the problem is TFP, but I sort of suspected that it is. There's a book by Alexander Field about the Great Depression, which says the Great Depression was really wonderful because it greatly stimulated innovation. And he uses TF, this is my memory from having read it a few years ago, because he uses TFP as his main measure. So that made me suspicious that TFP maybe is not a great measure because it seemed like a really implausible conclusion. So the only thing I'm really saying to Miko is, and I don't know why I should expect you to do what I haven't done. But if, if you could find some other measure besides TFP to reach the same conclusion, I would be really interested in it. So that's my other 
comment. Mika, you want to respond? Yeah, I mean, of, oh yeah, of course I agree. Of the, you know, only defense is of the many imperfect measures that's maybe still the most convincing. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I didn't want to spend 10 minutes going through whatever, have, you know, measuring scientific progress or technological progress, very difficult tasks because we're talking about, <laughs> they're always one, once, um, all of those can happen only once by definition. So uh, how, how to compare them and, and so on. It, it's very it's very difficult, but I think we should still do it. And and I, I think it, it still uh, rings true. And it, you know, this decline rings true and it, it matches other evidence. So, yeah. but I, I agree, it's very important. Could I just add a caveat here, Zalister, to say that we had a really comprehensive a series of presentations on the research around uh, purported decline or stagnation. And when the video of this workshop becomes available, we'll edit this raw, raw video. You'll be able to see that. It was a day long review of all the kind of the micro, meso, and macro evidence. And, you know, what we know, what we don't know, what type of research needs to be done in order to better clarify the situation. And all of those inputs will become chapters in the, the publication to which. Um, your conversations here will be folded in. Thank you. Can I just say in the discussion about the role that citations play and their increasing role, um, there's a quote by Richard Catlow that I think is very germane to this. And so um, Richard Catlow said, upon becoming the Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society, I was lucky when I began my scientific career in the 1970s, I had no real sense of how my work was cited. If I had been citation driven, I might have abandoned a field that is now central. By the 1990s, when, criteria, when citation data became prominent, I was already a full professor. I, I think that's a, a really nice statement of some of the um, adverse effects on scientific research that citation focus has created. I just wanted to follow up on something that, that Gabriella had said uh, in terms of concerns about intellectual property and so on. But before she left, Julia Lane had made a distinction between using metadata and having more confidentiality or protections of the, the core data. I didn't want to lose track of that. Uh, it is a kind of derivative or a secondary um, process, but there may be ways that, that we can think about metadata uh, to broaden the kinds of, of research that can be done. Um, and then while, while I have the, the open mic, I, I wanted to respond to something that Marianne had said uh, which is she she pointed to the administrative burden and and certainly in the United States that has been growing. Uh, there's a compliance culture. So as, as she observed, not only are there more personnel at universities and other research organizations for that matter, but there's just much more reporting that is non real or productive work uh, by researchers. And I, I wanted to reinforce the notion that AI and other technologies might actually be helpful in, in shrinking this load and getting the, the allocation of time of researchers back to their, their core research. That in turn could lead to more of the novelty of ideas that, that Miko was talking about. Miko, is, do you have your hand or it was from before? You're muted. Yeah. Yes, Kek. Um, I, um, I I wanted to make a comment about the J curve that uh, that Reinhilde mentioned, uh, which is roughly the idea that uh, uh, you know these the impacts of these big, big technologies uh, can, can take a very long time to materialize, and um, we might be underestimating AI. Um, I mean, that, that's very true. Uh, but at the same time, it's also, we're, we're still waiting for the benef benefits of uh, uh, computers to materialize, right? I mean, they, they came, you know, 50 and more years ago, and we, we haven't gotten the benefits that we, we, we thought we would get uh, in terms of uh, living standards and uh, 
productivity, however you measure it. Now, maybe AI will bring it, um, but there's a, you, you know, there, there's a, I, th I think there's a great danger that we think that you, yeah, there's nothing wrong here uh, in terms of science or innovation. AI, AI will, uh, you know, take us to the next next level. I mean, I guess it's possible. I, I've been working, you know, in, in, in working on um, AI related uh, topics on and off since 1996. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it, but I'm also very skeptical. Um, uh, I, I, I wouldn't take it for granted. Um, I mean, there's one example is that uh, for, for a full decade now, we'll be waiting for the driverless cars to arrive in two years, right? And now they're at least 10 years away, right? At least. So, so it says, I think it's, it's very dangerous to take, take it for granted, but we should work on it. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. But I think the J curve also makes a very important point: is that it it may take a lot of time before you get the potential large breakthrough uh, advances from AI here. And the reason why it takes time is because you need to invest in a lot of other complementary technologies that need to be at place. Sometimes these technologies also still need to develop sufficiently before they become fully complementary. You also need to to, to invest in 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 um, building the right skills, educating people. So that all takes time. And so building all that complementarity before you actually get the breakthrough results. And even these breakthroughs will not always be in all areas here. Some will actually be way more open for the benefits of AI than, than other fields here. So in that respect, I, I do think we cannot expect just now that AI is here and, and we have already a few applications on being, on being able to... Uh, to play Go or whatever, that doesn't really mean already that now AI and its effect should immediately be clear here. It will take time. And I think the problem is if, if we if we would now say, because we don't see the immediate effects yet, it's it's not a good <laughs> trajectory to follow. That's not it. And so my the point I wanted to make is we should take a longer term perspective and we should also make sure that we make sure that we get these complementary um, tools that need to be in place, that we have all the conditions in the system that that these complementary tools will be there uh, and that uh, people will actually be investing in building these complementary tools uh, here. So I just want to reinforce what you're saying, Rinhilda, because we know with this J curve that it accelerates, right? And it's sort of like once you realize if you're not prepared for it, then it's too late. And so I, I think that, again, you know, we sort of want to make sure that academics don't end up in the same unfortunate position as gig workers. Thanks, but that Stuart. requires taking a longer term perspective. Eh? And if I'm oh, sorry. And if we get actually a system that's too much concentrated on, OK, we need short term returns <laughs> uh, like short term citations and stuff like that, we will be missing it. Eh? Stuart, you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, I was just thinking about um, Miko's talk and the idea that we focus too much on incremental work. And again, it's this, it's this strange paradox, because if you say that in my field, then people, or, or at least in the, in the field of kind of open science within psychology, people will say, well, wait a minute, isn't the problem that we don't spend enough time doing incremental stuff and we're too focused on the next breakthrough and so on. And certainly if you read the, uh, the literature, it looks like there's breakthroughs happening all the time. There's a study of like the language used in abstracts and the 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 amount of times people have used the words, you know, breakthrough, groundbreaking, innovative, all that sort of stuff has gone absolutely through the roof. And there's some prediction that by 2040 something, it'll, these words will be used in every single scientific abstract if you if you just extrapolate the if you just extrapolate the line. Um, uh, and so I, again, I have to, you know I'm trying to resolve this paradox. Because clearly there is some evidence that that the future is getting further away and and, and so on. And I, I've seen that Alex Tabarrok stuff before, and I, I'm I'm a, I'm a fan of his. So is it a situation where we're in the worst of both worlds, where scientists think they're making progress, or at least are incentivized to claim that they're making progress all the time in order to keep their uh, citations going and get into higher impact journals and 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 get their tenure and their jobs and all that sort of stuff and grants, but actually we're 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 in fact going in the opposite. Uh, uh, direction and is there something about the way that we incentivize and publish research that that we could we could change in order to to make them focus on actually producing robust 
uh, uh, innovations rather than, you know, we need to we need to have in, innovations, but we need to have innovations that we can trust. And at the moment, I, I see research that claims that it's a massive breakthrough and, 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 and so on. And uh, I almost trust it less than if it said, you know, than if it was than if it was much more much more circumspect. Uh, and, and I think we I think we almost should tr trust it less. Um, there's certainly lots of evidence that, you know, papers in high impact journals get more have more uh, have more problems, although, of course, they get much more scrutiny for being in those high impact journals. So um, I don't know what you think of the the kind of the, the weird paradox of scientists claiming they're breaking they're making breakthroughs all the time. And yet the breakthrough is slowing and slowing and slowing, as you as you described. You know, I, I'd like to speak to this because I think that this is a systemic problem. And so scientists really want to have these high impact factors, lots of citations, because then it allows them to get more grants, right? Gives them a reputation and then more money. And this hyper competition in science is not benefiting um, anyone. Um, there was a citation in the chat to, um, you know, the adverse effects on postdocs and uh, people starting out their career. And, you know, this is, um, you know, uh, just, I think, very problematic. And so I just want to reiterate that I think we can use AI to fix the system, not to really fix the scientists. You know, let's allow the scientists to do what what they do well and use AI then as a, um, a tool and that's something that makes the scientific enterprise more robust and more sustainable. Yeah, well said, Marion. <laughs> I could have said it better. I, I would also like to make a point that it's not about incremental versus uh, radical new science uh, here. I think we really have to have Basically, they are complementary, right? Because uh, a new radical idea needs incremental improvements here in order to to to, to be big impact, uh, and and the incremental ones need really also the breakthroughs in order to to have something to work on further here. So we need in the system to have the two here, and we need to find a good equilibrium between the two here. But what we need to avoid is that there would be any bias against one of the two here. And so what the evidence so far shows is that the way in which our system is designed, there is a bias against the risky research that creates the breakthroughs uh, here. And that's what we need to avoid here. It's not that we now need to only fund the breakthrough research, forget about incremental. It's it's finding a better way so that they can complement uh, each other within the system. Indeed, that's really true. And uh, Alistair, you wanted to ask some? Yeah, if I may, uh, just a query to Miko, um, following on from a lot of the work which we heard about yesterday regarding the use of AI in language-based discovery, looking at uh, scientific text, where there's all sorts of different approaches to measuring uh, measuring novelty. And I wondered, because you, you sort of gave great weight to the importance of, um, of promoting novelty, and then you mentioned that you have a few uh, suggestions as to how that might be measured. And I wondered then if you were just to think um, in a hypothetical world, if you had a sort of, if you could fantasize about what the, what an AI would do for you in helping to understand novelty and helping to measure novelty, um, what what would you most want an AI system to help with? Um, so that that's a that's a good question. Um, Hopefully, I remember to uh, respond to Stuart's uh, comment as well. The the um, so I've um, in in measuring novelty, I've used some uh, um, machine learning approaches, uh, and I've used uh, just very very basic text analysis approaches. And I, I'd say that the the text analysis approach dominates ten to one in terms of the ins insight that you get out of it. Uh, reviewers, of course, would like uh, me to. Uh, Utilize machine learning, uh, and um, and but but at, at this stage, I think the more uh, simpler methods are, are way more uh, way more illuminating. Uh, but you know, the hope is that over time, it, you know, instead of being ten to one, it's you know ten to hundred, so that the, the AI AI methods uh, methods uh, in, improve. Um, I mean, so, so you know, one thing that people use them for is uh, is. Um, Identify use AI in this text mining is to is to 
um, look at the, you know, kind of the distance between two papers based on the text. Uh, they put them in these vector spaces and then you can uh, get measures of similarity um, and, uh, and novelty and, uh, and what, you know, what, what kind of terms drive those differences. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot, lot of potential, um, but, but, but uh, you know, we're, we're early on the, on the J curve there at, at least. Um, the, uh, in terms of Stuart's comment uh, 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 about psychology, uh, I, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't read a lot of psychological papers. So, so, so what I'm about to say is just a complete amateur opinion. So don't, don't bother, don't bother. No, no, I, 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 do, I, do, want, I do want to, because I want to <laughs> hear what you. you think about this. So this citation, uh, so, so first of all, when, when scientists claim that they're, you know, working on an innovative breakthrough, I think that's an oxymoron. Uh, 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 in the sense that if you're doing something innovative, you don't really know it, even yourself what you're working on, right? Uh, it, it'll take a it, it'll take a it'll take a long time for you to understand what it's about. It'll take even longer for others to understand what it's about and whether whether it's, whether it's a breakthrough or not. So I, I think the citation obsession has uh, one thing that it has done, and maybe this has happened to uh, psychologists. Uh, I mean, it certainly happened to economists. Is that it? It is just kind of broken our brains about in terms of how we how we perceive scientific progress, right? That you, you know, I, I think a lot of people genuinely believe uh, that giant science advances in these uh, in these huge leaps that a paper is either very good or it's worth nothing, right? Whereas, like my opinion is, no, actually, the the, the knowledge advances very very slowly, and we we built this. Uh, you know, just think about CRISPR. They they, they built this uh, uh, huge uh, corpus of knowledge, um, and only then they could you know figure out something useful out of it. Um, and I, I don't I don't think that's a view people people share these days. Um, um, you know, people subscribe to this kind of this, uh, this great man theory of science, where it's like you know these eureka moments, and that you know those alone all alone are are, are useful. Um, and uh, so I, I think one thing that, you know, re redesigning Google Scholar would do is that it would force people to think about, okay, how does science really progress? Oh, I see, I see. Um, uh, it, it Maybe it progresses very different than, than a, what, how I think it does. Okay. I think we have to wrap up because we have a very interesting talk to come uh, by Professor Daniel and Professor King on how to quantify the contribution of AI to scientific discovery. So, but after that, we, we have a general discussion with everybody so we can continue to, the, to discuss this issue. So I just wanted to, to thank uh, the panelists. So thanks again. And um, yeah, this is our second contribution today. And we are going to be talking about how to quantify or at least come up with some attempts to quantifying the contribution of AI to scientific discovery. And again, these are more questions and answers. And that is because if we cannot agree on how to measure productivity in science, human productivity, I think it is going to be perhaps more difficult or perhaps not because it is uh, less biased, but I think it's going to be at least equally difficult to quantify AI contribution in science because it's it's already happening and actually in this morning we had a discussion on how to quantify alpha fold contribution to the a tandem of a um, google DeepMind team plus um, the alpha fold um, system so one question is how to transition from measuring productivity in science to measuring uh, contribution of ai in science as it is already happening so ideally, I think there, there should be two measures here that are very relevant. One is the speed up, the rate of acceleration, um, which we think it is perhaps mo much difficult to quantify than other possible measures because we think that it's going to be highly domain dependent and method dependent. So imagine if we wanted to quantify the acceleration in a single domain, obviously there could be different methods addressing the same problem and they could have different acceleration. So it is going to be not a very robust measure because it's going to be dependent on at least two variables. But that would be the ideal case if we could put some measure, at least an order of magnitude or something. Perhaps we could use something like a big O notation and actually take, for example, the best uh, 
accelerator. Right? So instead of taking all the methods or the average, it could be that like the best one. But again, it's not going to be a robust measure over time because it's going to be changing. Uh, the other aspect I was um, I wanted to cover is that also the other variable, very important variable that we would like to measure is how much knowledge we gain by applying AI. So not only how fast and how much we can accelerate, but how much do we gain? But again, I think it is a, a difficult question, and I don't think we even agree on when we use humans, um, human science, to quantify how much or how relevant is a discovery. And that's basically why we have prices, right? We, we believe that Nobel prizes, for example, are those that are, are making the highest contribution to uh, scientific knowledge. But again, it is uh, very biased and, and subjective. So uh, we talked about this at the beginning of the day. So Ross and I are involved in a report that we are um, developing at the Alan Turing Institute um, for the Nobel Turing Challenge, and as we also call it, a Turing AI scientist. And it is about exploring um, topics related to an AI that is capable of making high quality discoveries, worthy of, for example, a Nobel Prize in science. And to do so completely autonomously, at a level comparable and most likely superior to the best uh, human scientists. And we are exploring how that roadmap, roadmap would look like uh, from now to um, 2050. And we are covering some aspects that we believe uh, some other reports are not covering, such as including uh, lab automation in this um, closed um, loop experimental cycle. Uh, led by AI and its full implications. And especially the question of how to close the full discovery cycle, because right now we have contributions of AI at different uh, places. Uh, but I think we have very little evidence of actually closing the full cycle and have it fully automated from beginning to end. So the project aims to cover um, some of the most important aspects or what we believe is very important, such as knowledge extraction and knowledge representation, both domain specific and then from the general perspective. So if we have a, uh, artificial general intelligence, what we would expect is that actually that system will be able to um, extract and represent knowledge from um, a multiplicity of domains, all domains. But I think it is a transition that is going to happen. So we are going to go from domain specific to general domain. Then self-driven hypothesis generation and open-ended um, exploration of the hypothesis space. And that is another very interesting topic because I think so far, even the most sophisticated uh, systems have been given the hypothesis space. Um, as I said, we are also very interested in AI-driven um, instrument automation for experimental acceleration. And two of those examples are uh, Ross um, um, robot scientists. Also, and there have been some um, talks about this, contextual rejection, validation, and verification of both hypotheses and models. Then also something we touched upon uh, this morning, interpretation and re reinterpretation of results, including what I think Alistair was uh, asking before um, interpreting accidents as, as, as a source of uh, innovation. And uh, there has been little research on the topic, but I think there, there has been a couple of groups that have been done some research on computational serendipity. And we are also trying to do a, a little bit uh, ourselves as part of the, the report and beyond. As I said, it is very important in our uh, approach to think about how to clo close the full experimental loop. So that means also that when the system uh, produces some result, it, it gets incorporated into the um, knowledge uh, database and gets um, taken into account for the next iteration of the discovery cycle. 
And then obviously the hope is that we are going to be able to not necessarily come up with obviously a, 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 an ultimate roadmap, but, but something we can say this may happen before actually reaching these milestones. And especially some sort of implementation plan so that we can advise uh, governments, especially uh, the UK and the US that have been very supportive of this project. So these are some of the milestones we think may happen over time. And it is very difficult also to come up with these things because uh, most likely they are going to be wrong. This is almost like making some predictions. And for some of them, whatever you take, you, you may think, oh, actually that, that has already happened. You know? so, so you're going to have someone telling you there's some literature already about this or we are not yet there. So it is very difficult to locate uh, every one of these items. Uh, but we have divided these milestones into four uh, large roadmaps, representation, reasoning, execution, and communication. Com communication, for example, has to do with um, language-based uh, modeling. Uh, we go all the way from generate summaries of uh, scientific articles, which again, you can say that there's already some um, research in this area all the way to producing perhaps a critique of a, a whole scientific field. And by that, we mean perhaps that the AI is going to be able to pinpoint where we have been biased or where are the gaps in that domain that we have not covered. And especially because if we allow AI to be able to explore the full capabilities, the hypothesis space, and even come up with the space themselves, then we are going to find that perhaps we are exploring small corners in those hypothesis spaces. And then decide why we have explored only those corners, because it could be that it's only those ones that are very relevant to um, human challenges, or perhaps we have been neglecting other areas that could also have some social impact and we have been overlooked uh, over time. And one of them, for example, is the execution. So it goes all the way from um, automating uh, the um, experimental cycle, to um, explaining uh, mistakes along the way of the experiment to winning the Nobel Prize in a scientific field. And in reasoning, again, we have, uh, for example, from generating scientific questions to passing any um, open-ended scientific or professional exam. So these are some ideas, and I, uh, we would love to hear your opinions, and, uh, and not only on this, but in the next slides, also in the discussion because we are also very open to the community. And if you would like to contribute to this report, we would also love to, to have you and, and hear your opinion. So obviously to achieve all this, we, we have a, a lot of methods and technologies around. And uh, one of the purposes of the project is also explore um, um, the, some of these algorithms, not in great depth, but at least to be aware of the large classifications of all these methods. And in the morning, we were talking, for example, of model-driven, which I think is smaller than this, but this is just a visual artifact. I think statistical data-driven approaches are dominating uh, the current AI and machine learning. And then you have the small um, areas like um, quantum machine learning, which it is promising in the sense that if it happens, could be a game changer, but at the same time, it is a, a still kind of a, a, at a stage where, where if not all, um, many is still speculative. But I think it is a combination of these methods that are going to take us where we want to be. And, and in the morning, we explored some of these approaches where we are trying to take the best of both worlds, statistically uh, data-driven approaches such as most of the deep learning um, space, together with things like neurosymbolic and causal deconvolution. So one interesting thing is if we are making this progress, how we are going to be able to tell whether we have achieved something or not. So we have to have some sort of measure to evaluate. So one inspiration we took um, was the Society of Automotive Engineers classification for um, driverless uh, cars. And there are six levels uh, going from 
zero to five, where zero is basically no automation. So these are normal driving. Uh, the human is uh, uh, literally driving every piece of the car. One is driver assistance, and we are somewhere in, in between one and two, I think. So driver assistance is parking assistance or cruise control. Perhaps some people may even consider having a GPS and those kind of things. Um, partial automation, I think it is a, um, also a combination of automation, like acceleration. Again, it could be the cruise control because, um, but I think that is still with human intervention, right? Because you have to push the thing. Um, but between one and two is basically assistance and automation, but then three is where it gets a little bit more interesting. And when we are trying, we are starting to transfer some of our responsibility of driving to AI. And uh, all the way to five, which is full automation, no human intervention. And I think we are still uh, far from there. Uh, there's a lot of hype, but there has been for the last 10 years and we are not uh, yet uh, at that point. So in spite of this um, classification, we were thinking how we could do something similar in AI. You know? This is again another um, representation of this transfer of, responsi of responsibility from human to machines. And basically it's all about leaving certain aspects of driving uh, alone, all the way to having no human on the driver's seat. So for any classification, what we would like to is to have something useful, understandable, um, smart for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound, and also robust, both in the sense that it is easy to assign levels and that it is going to be robust over time so we don't keep changing the classification over time. So we came up with um, some ideas and this is a yearly stage, it is a work in progress. So obviously level zero is very easy because it is basically no automation, so traditional um, human science you know, before computers existed. Uh, most of science has been developed uh, this way. Level one would, would be machine assistance, so pretty much all that started, I don't know, that difficult to put an, a date there. Some people may think that perhaps beginning of last um, century, some people maybe that with data science in the 80s, maybe even 90s. And, um, statistical machine learning, um, all those things, Terran Prover is an old one, for example, it is perhaps uh, 50s, 60s. So all that would belong to level one ma machine assistance. Uh, level two would be uh, that an important aspect of the discovery cycle is fully automated. So it could be the simulation or the extraction of knowledge, testing propositions, and I think we are already doing some of this. Level three will be model selection and generation. So almost like equivalent to having a knowledgeable uh, peer with some agency uh, that you can give a set of hypotheses and then follow the consequences. And perhaps here the theorem provers are also quite advanced in, in some way, but they also are limited because they don't learn over time. They are very deterministic. Um, <clears throat> then we have a level four, which will be closing the loop. So we can generate and explore the hypothesis space, but there is still one aspect, at least in the discovery cycle, that is not fully automated. And it could be anything, perhaps it is just data curation and that we are feeding the AI system all the information. Um, and then we have a level five, which would be the uh, full automation. So uh, covering all other levels and no human intervention. And it will be basically the equivalent of a human scientist, if not superior. So uh, here are some examples. So level, level zero is very easy huh? because it is basically all the pre-electronic machines um, science that we have been doing for centuries. Then level one, as I said, is perhaps um, uh, what we are doing today, a combination of one and two. Um, things like, for example, data science, data analytics. So here is an example with a Kepler Space Telescope generating a lot of data, but without the use of a computer to analyze all this data, we wouldn't be able to really uh, 
uh, extract all the this information about exoplanets. Perhaps we would have done very little, if any, because we are talking about really a lot of data and, and very small signals. Then we have the level two, which um, mm. one could argue that is ma machine learning, but I want to think that is more on the physics-driven and model-driven uh, approach. And I think one good example is, for example, weather forecasting, which is very much based on uh, dynamical systems. So there's a physical representation. And it requires little human intervention because obviously these uh, weather forecasters are giving uh, information almost in real time. So they have uh, automated almost the whole process, except that they are not creating models themselves. Huh? So the model is already fixed. It is humans that come up with a weather model. They implement it and then they let the system to do everything else, the simulation, ingesting the data, all that pretty much in real time. Uh, here, an open question whether we would place alpha fold level two, uh, level one, level three. I think it is uh, open. I think I wouldn't put, put it in level three because level three in this classification would be something more like auto ML, which is really about trying to pick up the best model for that um, observation. And obviously, auto ML is in a very, a very early stage, and perhaps it is also kind of domain specific. So you have only a short list of possible models, but I think it is going in that direction. That is the AI that chooses a model, the best model for the data. And I think we have only reached level four or perhaps even five with um, the robot uh, scientist that uh, Ross was talking about with Eva Adam, which uh, is where and when a lot of acceleration, especially in experimental science can happen. And there was pretty much no human intervention except perhaps for, for providing the consumables to the machine. So according to our community with this report, um, they believe that systematic access and exploitation of level two and three should happen uh, within the next five years. I don't know if that is optimistic, realistic, but we would love to hear about you in the discussion, discussion after this uh, session. Uh, systematic reach of level four may happen in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, and systematic reach of level five should happen in the next 20, 30 years. So that's kind of the roadmap we are trying to propose in this report for the UK and US governments. And here systematic basically means that the, the large of the scientific community has access to this kind of uh, level of AI. So I'm going to stop there for any questions and I'm looking forward to the discussion and what you think about this um, classification. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Hector. And uh, I see already one hand up, but I just will also refer to a point that came up in the chat, if you saw it from Gary Burcross, that there may be some more details to add in your classificatory grid having to do with, um, in terms of the the level of um, the level of autonomy achieved, that has to do with the way that in AI interacts with part of scientific teams. Mm -hmm. This would also be a, a, an important benchmark to factor into uh, into your grid. Yeah, that is a great angle. Thank you, Gary. And, uh, Peter, you had, uh, you had your hand up. Yes, uh, thanks. That, that was an excellent presentation. Um, uh, uh, concerning the classification, which uh, I think is pretty good, I was just wondering uh, how we can uh, map it with the OECD valued uh, principles, uh, for instance, uh, human-centric values and fairness, whether we can incorporate the valued principles in uh, in your in your in your classification. I don't know how we can uh, do that. Um, thanks. Yeah, sure. That is a difficult one, and, and we basically decided to leave a little bit of uh, social impact and ethics aside because we think we wouldn't uh, uh, give it a um, make it just justice if we just. Uh, take it as a small topic. It is a huge topic that has to be addressed by its own, I think. Uh, one point is that uh, at the moment, the Canadian government has got uh, 
committee investigating the uh, ethical and legal aspects of the application of AI to science. So they're busy writing a report uh, uh, for the basically the Canadian Research Councils. Mm -hmm. Okay. That should be available early next year, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ross. Um, as I don't see any other hands up right now, maybe I can just comment on a couple of points and maybe raise a question or two. Um, so, uh, may, maybe if we're thinking about the impacts on productivity of science overall, then uh, maybe we need some a kind of a, if we're looking at trying to make an assessment here using a sort of multi method approach, we would want to know something about where the main cost items come in the overall scientific process. So, the, the weight between um, labor the wages of science and say equipment and machinery, um, in digital infrastructure and so on. And that probably varies across the main. And the, then the time may be required for specific scientific processes. So um, on Friday, we'll have a presentation uh, from Jung Won, who will be presenting the work of a group in California that's trying to use GPT-3 to develop a an AI research assistant and talking with them, they had some numbers about how long it typically takes a research proposal to be prepared. And it was X number of months, I think it was like eight months on average. And their idea was to try and compress this time using their technology down to X number of weeks. I think it was two to a month. She'll give a live demonstration of that, of that system. So, Maybe first, I'm kind of making some random or thinking off the top of my head here, but maybe coming towards a point, which would be that um, uh, I wonder if it would be helpful at this early stage, and maybe even to get a grip on, to add further to your uh, to your grid, if there were some maybe in, uh, whether it would be valuable to do some select case studies. Um, it's very difficult to get aggregate measures here, uh, but to actually, you know, have researchers, uh, people who are interested in the science of science, um, look at the applications in, for particular projects in particular processes within science, um, and you know, try and generate evidence of this sort. So, of course, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be systematic in the sense it applies across the whole of science, but for some. For some fields, for some experiments, in some processes of science, maybe we could get some uh, some more some more illumination there. For example, about this issue of compressing the time it, it requires to prepare research proposals, or maybe the economic potential economic benefits of efficient choice of potential experiments. I could imagine that setting up experiments in some domains must be very costly that if AI can help choose efficiently between one experiment over another uh, from the whole universe, universe of possible experiments, that could also have an economic effect. So any, any thoughts there about, uh, about these points? I think Ross has probably experience with his robot scientist to quantify how much acceleration here is one or two orders of magnitude no, compared to having humans doing the same work, Ross. Uh, yeah, so for the uh, work with Eve, we did quite a lot of work trying to uh, cost the different, uh, well, cost how much every, everything, ex how much the actual different parts of the drug design process take. So you would cost the, uh, the time taken, uh, cost the uh, materials, uh, uh, cost how much you would save in time and materials, uh, cost the things you miss because you, you're you trying to be clever and, and not do everything. Uh, and at least in that simple application of uh, in a, an early stage drug design, it, we argued that the evidence was that you would save quite a lot of time and, and money, which are basically the same things uh, mm. in drug design. Uh, unless missing certain things costs a lot of money. So basically you save time and money by not doing everything, by trying to be clever. And if, if you miss something, which is very important, then 
of course, you had to do everything. So we did some work on that, trying to, but it was actually quite difficult to get real numbers out to the pharmaceutical industry, what this things really cost. I don't know whether they even know themselves, you know, <laughs> in my cynical moments. Uh, yeah. uh, for grant applications, I'm skeptical about whether AI can really help write them. One thing that would help the uh, community would be just for their research councils to turn them around a bit faster. You know, it's yeah. when you submit a grant application, it normally takes the best part of six months to make a to make a decision on that. And it's not the top or why, at least for yeah. us and uh, submitters. Uh, yeah. It's not that uh, what Jung Wan will demonstrate is a system aimed at helping to actually write a grant proposal. It's more like having an intelligent collaborator that systematically asks you questions about what you're doing and suggests different avenues of literature to look at. To uh, so it's more like having a sort of a catalyst, uh, but anyway, we'll we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it. So I, one, uh, I'm not sure if it's really the case, but it's, it seems to me that uh, the competition for grants is getting tougher all the time. You know, people are getting yeah. better, better at writing them. Uh, so it's that's one thing that makes it harder for people to to start in science is that uh, just getting your first grants is more and more competitive because. The people that have been doing it for a long time have got better at it and the, the bar is constantly rising and what's expected in a grant application. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, uh, I don't see any hands further. Please, everybody, feel free to chime in on any... Um, on any and uh, one comment I had on the, on the previous session was about, you know, wording and breakthroughs in, in scientific papers. You know, it's... Uh, uh, for these top journals, you often have to, to get past the initial uh, cut. You have to sort of claim a lot of stuff, you know, it's otherwise it's, you won't make it through the first cut. And with my papers, I've been criticized for uh, saying it's too much of a breakthrough. Uh, and the reason that I did that was just to get through the first cut, because when we didn't have these words and they didn't make the cut, you know, it's... it's you're sort of, that's a dilemma as a scientist. You know, you don't want to uh, say something uh, too exaggerated, but if, unless you exaggerate a bit, you won't get through the past the editors, you know. Yeah. There has been some research looking retrospectively at different um, milestones in AI forecasts going back the last 60 years or so, which shows that there's a, a kind of system systemic systematic uh, tendency to um that, like the estimations are always wrong they're nearly always wrong there the the actual achievements you know can come many years after they're typically projected to be and uh, I'll, I'll forward the link to that work well actually uh i think recently it's i've been wrong in the, in the other direction huh. i'm too pessimistic about how fast changes have been you know it's uh, yeah. i see that tony has a please Yes, uh, another interesting debate, uh, but hold on, I'm trying to st start my video, yeah. Uh, interesting debate, but but I, I'm concerned about, the fields are very different. So I, I used to be a particle physicist, and um, in one of Feynman's uh, celebrated lectures, the ones he gave at Cornell, he bemoans the fact that, you know, once you've discovered the fundamental laws of, of physics, strong interactions, weak interactions, and so on, there isn't any more to be discovered. And so uh, it's a rather unique time in, in particle physics that, you know, you've actually got one chance to do this. And it isn't the experiments you need to do need to be on, on a scale like LHC and so on. And it's not clear you can do the next generation because they're getting so expensive and the returns, the knowledge you get will have so little impact on everybody's daily life. So it, it seems to me that field is, is different and it isn't that AI won't, AI, AI, AI does help in the analysis of the data from LHC and the physicists have been using that for many years and they've adopted deep learning when appropriate, but they also use Bayesian and all sorts of other stuff. So, um, but it's very different from Ross as Eve and Adam, all right? Because there you have, you can do experiments very quickly, you can turn them around and you can do this. And it's it's totally uncomparable to to 
particle physics or the even the astronomy that, that they're in a different phase they're looking at fundamental science as opposed to it, lots of things to be done in biomolecular science chemistry materials life sciences but they're of a different character from a, a, a truly fundamental science uh, and it's not to say they're any worse uh, but but i think we do understand all the major forces it's how they act in complex situations is what we're trying to find out now and that's that's a very complicated thing and so i i worry about the trying to do it ai for all fields in one framework it seems to me a little ambitious and uh, i i'm a little skeptical of its um, general applicability well as you know tony there's still there's big questions in fundamental science, you know, uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity are not really compatible and no one quite knows why. And Oh, I, I absolutely yeah. agree, but I doubt I mean, that there AI is, has There's that. dark energy, there's dark matter, there's huge questions still. Like, you know, yes, there's dark, it, it's true there are some, and certainly the, the, the model we have of the early universe with the you know inflation and the big bang and stuff like that is is hardly enormously convincing and certainly we apparently don't know most of the matter and the energy in the universe so i agree there are still major things but i do think it's in a different category than the the the, the sort of experiments that you can do in the life sciences or or, or that you that adam and eve do Okay, I, but I, I suppose I do have a gripe against the particle physicists. When you know, when I, in uh, when I was in India, I, there is uh, in Rajasthan is the biggest uh, sundial in the world. It's about fifty meters high, and it's accurate to a few seconds in a day. You know, but that's not how to make a good clock nowadays. You know, and I think the particle physicists are a bit, you know, just this big, this build a collider the size of Texas or something. You know, it's I think. They need to think cleverer about how to focus the energy rather than just, you know, I, it's not that much energy as long as you focus it. Well, I think, uh, uh, yeah, the SST you're talking about in Texas was never funded. And that's that prompted John Horgan's book, The End of Science, was, was you know, again, too broad. It was too general and didn't apply to all fields. But there are different characteristics and different types of applied science. And... Uh, whilst I can see there is slowdown in productivity in some areas, I don't think that's necessarily true in all areas. So I just feel <laughs> these generalizations may be nice, but it's not clear that they're supported by uh, detailed evidence. But it's a personal opinion, I admit, Ross. Okay, well, yes. I'm sorry, I'm, I lost over going off on a tangent. Uh, no, well, uh, that's okay. That's okay. Well, it's, yeah. It is the last session of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk broadly. Um, just before I see, there's a hand up, Nico. But maybe I could just go to a comment in the chat there that has come in from my colleague uh, Carthage Smith. So he, I don't know. Do you see this one, Hector? Um, on your one yes. to five, yeah. I on, even replied on on the chat as well, but we can oh, talk about it. I think it's a very interesting yeah. question. So energy consumption, uh, for example. No? So one one may think that perhaps the higher in the level, the level, the higher consumption. But I was thinking uh, and, uh, that actually it should be the other way around. Eh? Because if we want to get to human level efficiency, actually we should require less energy rather than more. Well, yes, it is a very interesting question, and maybe we can have like different classifications and see which one is uh, the best one representing what we want to measure. Hmm. Miko, you have your hand up. The uh, so I'm, I'm um, like like I said before, I'm 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 fairly skeptical about AI's uh, potential, also in the robot uh, scientist. Uh, Dimension, for example, all economics papers have a glaring flaw in them, and I just, I just don't, don't understand how a robot economist could, uh, could make those same, uh, uh, same errors. Uh, so how, how, how could, these, um, how, how could these AI systems uh, kind of function in, in that uh, very imperfect uh, in, in environment? But, uh, but then I'm, in my head, I'm trying to think about okay, what's a, what's a positive case for, uh, for AI? You know, might I be underestimating it? And I guess the the best story I can come up with uh, is that uh, uh, is that we 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 humans are 
we're very differential with other people, right? And so when when somebody when somebody presents some paper and there's some glaring flaws in it, we you know we don't point out all the flaws. Often we you know don't say anything, um, but we're not differential with machines. So when when, when for example, um, uh, DeepMind published that Alpha Zero paper, um, some some of the reception was uh, was very harsh, um, and it, it occurred to me that. Uh, that people would never have been that harsh if the key contributions of the paper had been uh, produced by humans alone as, as opposed to machines. So I'm just wondering what, what people are operating in this area uh, see this, like are, 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 do, do you feel like there's some, um, uh, let's say excess skepticism uh, along these lines that people are okay with uh, arguing with machines when they're not, they don't want to say the same things to you know. We're we're very polite with humans, but we're not polite with machines. Uh, well, I think that I would argue that of course AI systems are really good at doing certain things. You know, they're much better at uh, doing logical reasoning. They're much better at finding patterns and data which is not uh, human friendly, uh, like chemicals. You know, we're not. We didn't evolve uh, to deal with chemical structures naturally like we do with faces and things like that. So I think that it's really clear that AI systems are better at certain things than human beings already. Uh, and these things are related to science. So uh, I also think that uh, having AIs doing a lot of the uh, spade work in science will help with reproducibility and things like that because they can do, they're, they're less bored, they record everything. Uh, it's, it's much more explicit what's going on compared to a, a human scientist. So I think there's all, there are benefits there as well about uh, just making the science a bit cleaner because machines have done it. Uh, so I, and having criticism of scientists, actually some scientists quite like to do that. You know, there's, uh, I haven't noticed uh, people being particularly shy about criticism uh, in general, maybe in economics or something, they're they're politer than in the physical sciences. In paper reviews, they they tend to be extremely harsh against humans. I think. Um. Perhaps I can ask that um, with regard to AI powered, AI enabled laboratory robots. Um, I know with the example that you gave of the work to find a compound which was ultimately effective against a strain of the malaria parasite, I think it was, that you were working on, uh, Ross, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the, that use of such a system seems to be uh, specific to a particular type of experimentation, high combinatorics, in molecular biology or chemistry and so on. Do you, is that the main area where you see the use of these AI-enabled lab robots? Uh, not particularly. I think that example is quite well documented now. So, that, well, I, I believe it's used industrially by the pharmaceutical companies to do sort of thing like that. Uh, and... A lot of AI companies have gained a lot of value in the pharmaceutical area because of they built because the pharmaceutical industry believes that they're of value. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, the area which AI-powered robots is most active is uh, this material science. Probably there it's uh, there are a number of well-documented cases uh, in in labs, in universities, and in industry. Uh, my particular interest is in systems biology at the moment, where the models are uh, incredibly complicated. Uh, they're sort of causal models, but there, there's thousands of interacting parts to them, which are it's very hard to disentangle how they work. Mm. And as Hiroaki Kitano points out, these models are beyond human sort of uh, intuitive understanding of how they work. Yeah. And biological systems are just so complicated that you know, we need to do orders of magnitude more experiments to, to figure out how they work, I think. Yeah. 
And in your work on the project for Turing, um, you've set out, have you, a, a sort of an R&D roadmap, the, the types of the concentrations of, of research that would be required to reach, or you think that would be required to reach these goals? And, and who might take up that funding in your, at least in your, your aim? I think Hector, you should speak to this. Sorry, the uh, sound was breaking up. Could you repeat, Alistair? Yeah, so in the work uh, for Turing, um, you're setting out a plan, a roadmap for the required research streams and inputs need, uh, that you think are, are needed? Yes, so what we are trying to do is to match uh, domains to AI technology and methods. So we have some sort of matrix where we can find those uh, gaps. So yeah, it's covering it, not, not much in much detail, but yes, there's some about this. Yeah, and, and you'll be looking principally to the public sector to support that work, or do you think there's private sector interest in some components? I think there's a private uh, sector interest as well. So that's one of the ideas. So I think they they are more, more advanced in the lab automation um, area, for example. Yeah. So if yeah. we wanted to make progress uh, with these ideas, I think we would need to incorporate them. If I don't see any other questions or there's no further points in the chat, I think, and no other hands up at the moment, um, we're clo closing in on the end of uh, on the end of play, as it were. So I think I'll just close the day. Thank you very much, everyone. See you Thank you very much. Take care.